and welcome everyone for day two of our in-person workshopping and our third workshop overall. Again, my name is Isabella Nicosia representing ISO Stakeholder Affairs and I'll be facilitating the web conference portion of today's meeting and helping out here in the room. Uh, before we get started, just a couple reminders like usual, today's meeting is being recorded. The recording is for informational and convenience purposes only, so any related transcription should not be reprinted without the ISO's permission. Um, for anyone on our virtual conference, if you need technical assistance at any time during today's meeting, you can send a chat to our event producer. Our event producer today is Michelle. And all the slides have been posted out on the ISO website, so you can get to that page by going to kaiso.com. You'll go to the Stay Informed tab, click Policy Initiatives. That'll take you to our main initiative landing page, and you'll scroll down, but see Day Ahead Market Enhancements, and they will be at the top of that page for you. So we will be taking questions and comments throughout the workshop today. For those in the room, we have a few handheld mics that we will circulate. So please be sure to use a microphone before asking your comment or question um, so that those on the phone can hear you. And just a reminder to please introduce yourself by uh, stating your name and then also your organization. And then for those online, you can raise your hand, it, hand using the raise hand feature in Zoom. We'll be keeping an eye on that throughout the workshop today. You can also send your question or comment via the chat and we will pass it along to um, the appropriate presenter. So the agenda for today, we're actually gonna flip this around a little bit. WPTF is gonna kick us off this morning and then um, we'll split the time uh, between WPTF and the ISO's presentation. And then we will wrap up today with next steps. So I'm going to invite Carrie up to the front and she will kick us off. Thanks. And then can you pull up my slides? Awesome. So hi everyone, I'm Carrie Bentley. I represent the Western Power Trading Forum. Um, I'm going to do this presentation with Callie Wells, oh, who is just walking in, perfect timing. Um, I'm gonna take the first part of it and then she's gonna do the second part. Um, we really appreciate the CAISO holding these workshops um, and for everything that um, has happened so far in support of this process. Um, next slide. So we have five topics we want to go through today. Um, we're gonna take some time and walk through these in detail. Um, the first one is going through, again, what I presented on um, the prior Friday um, on the 27th, which is our proposed separate benchmark and compare framework, which we're proposing as a way forward. Then we're gonna get into each of these components, um, but before benchmarking and comparing, just do a, a level set on the Western Power Trading Forum position. Next slide. Oh, one more, please. Okay, so topic one. So this is our framework. We presented on this last time, but it was really quick. So this time I just wanted to stress the importance of the individual components. So even though a lot of focus has been on the framework discussion of nodal versus zonal, and we believe there are still many elements that are applicable to both frameworks that are important to go through, um, either at a policy level or at a technical level. So we're gonna talk about these um, in more detail. We're only highlighting a few today, but um, our comments will have a full list of additional things. The reason why we're at the end of initiative and we still have all these different elements is because the design has been changing so rapidly. I think we haven't had the ability to go deep into several of the elements. So much of the elements I wanna discuss, we don't necessarily um, inherently disagree with. We just believe more discussion is needed. Um, in some cases, we believe there's some FERC risk. So that's the kind of the separate um, category. The next one is the benchmark framework. All this does is say, is this even a viable possible alternative? So when you're talking about zonal versus nodal, and I'll get into this a little bit more later, you know, there's a bunch of different ways you could do either of those designs. And what the benchmark does is it says, are these even feasible to explore further? And we believe that's an, an important first step because there's no need to go forward with an incredibly detailed design if it's not viable at the highest level. Um, oh. Someone is saying the sound went out. Jeff Nelson. Michelle, can you still hear us? 
can't. I can see me. Oh. Yes, I can. Okay. I don't know. Anna says she can't see me. Oh, because I'm because I'm too little. Is that what you mean? <laughs> okay, I need a chair, guys, to stand on. Anna can't see my face, and it's bothering her. <laughs> yeah. Okay, the audience is saying they can still hear you. So that's all right. Thank you. Sorry, Jeff, if you can't hear me, uh, I I don't know. Can you chat, Jeff, please? Um, okay, so <laughs> you can stand over here, maybe, Anna. Is that? But no, that's too awkward. Okay, um, so then the last one element is the compare. Um, so this is when you actually have enough of a design to start comparing them. And that's what Callie is gonna start to get into today. Okay, next slide. And then one more. Okay, so going into the separate issues. So we have quite a few of these. Um, some of them I think need to be addressed right now within the initiative. Other ones I think actually could wait um, until after it's filed at FERC. So the first one is what I believe to be the greatest FERC risk of this proposal and it's justification for the downward and balanced reserve product. And we've talked about this several times, but I wanna be really clear kind of where our position comes from. Um, one, when prior ISOs have taken a similar design to FERC, one of the things that FERC has rejected the designs on is the fact that they haven't demonstrated a need for the product. It's not enough to simply say, oh, we think the product will be zero, so it won't have much of an impact, or, oh, we need it for this other design element. If you take something to FERC to prove that it's just and reasonable, you actually have to show um, a reliability or efficiency need for the product. We're really concerned that maybe eventually there might be a need for a downward product, particularly after um, individual EIM entities join EDAM, that right now the CAISO can't um, justify it on its own. Um, you know, our own observations show that based on the CAISO data, there's a small amount of self-schedule cuts from renewables, most renewable energy bids in, so you could curtail it down economically, so we have a, a lot of downward capability there. Operator, operators rarely bias RUC downward, so it really isn't a replacement for RUC bias, and if one of the main goals of DAME, um, and in addition to efficiency, is to reduce, reduce RUC bias, um, I don't think the downward product is needed for that. And when we look at the Wien BAA's downward test, there doesn't seem to be much failures or by a significant amount. Um, and you know something that Petter brought up in the last meeting, you know the downward product adds a significant number of constraints to the market processes. So there are some downsides as well. Um, so you know I, I think I, the, if the Kaiso is solely doing the downward product because it's needed. Um, the way they're doing settlements or the way they're, you know, creating the requirements, I don't think that's a strong enough justification to take to FERC. And as the WPTF has always said, we're really in favor of this product going forward, and we don't want it see, we don't want to see it get rejected by FERC because of this. Um, so can you change your design? And how would you change your design if you didn't have the downward product? And, you know, can it be added later if needed? I think needs serious consideration. Next slide, please. So this one I'll just you know hit on a little bit. Um, so I think it's really unclear in my mind how the, the requirements connect with the resource efficiency tests and what they will do to resource commitment. Um, Kathleen talked a lot about the need for RAP and RSC conversations um, yesterday. We completely agree with her. We believe those discussions are needed, um, but we also believe we need to have more discussions on not only how does the IRP requirement interact with the IRSC test, but what happens if you procure based on a demand curve and what is the impact if then the demand curve causes you not to procure the full amount and you're doing a, uh, you know, an RSE test for the WEAM in real time, does it likely to pass that test simply because the demand curve caused you not to procure more the day ahead? I think there needs to be a stronger connection there, or at least it needs to be clearly articulated to stakeholders that the demand curve should not cause more WEAM RSE test failures. Um, and unless we talk about that to begin with, I, I worry we're gonna have some issues um, in real time. George, do you have a question? Sorry, Gary, to interrupt. Just, just really quick, uh, maybe it's important information for what you just said. Um, in the resource efficiency evaluation, 
we are not considering the demand curve. We're actually having a penalty on that, so you have to meet it. So although the demand curve may relax the requirement in IFM, when you procure the product for the RSC, you have to have enough capacity to pass the test. This is Callie Wells with WPTF. Um, so I think the concern is, I understand the, the RSC test in the day ahead is done before the IFM, but the question is in the IFM, if the demand curve kicks in, we don't procure enough. Now you go to real time and you have that pooled RSC test. You don't, you haven't procured as much imbalanced reserve capacity because of the demand curve in the IFM. So it's that connection. I understand the, the IFM RSC, but it's the, I guess the IFM results to the WEAM RSE that we're unclear about. Yeah, right. So you may go short in, in real time, but the capacity that, uh, if you pass the RSE test in the day ahead, then there is capacity to procure uh, the full uh, amount of uh, imbalance reserve requirements. Assuming that this capacity is still available in real time, it's an assumption. Okay, so you can challenge that assumption. Yeah, yeah, thank you, George. And so that's the exact point when I talk about what if you give up your transmission? What if you give up your resources because you didn't pass it? Um, and I, I think that lends itself to discussions on trade offs between the demand curve um, and the ultimate RSE um, beam test. Um, and so we have a couple other issues like that. A lot of them we believe can be worked through. We don't think um, that's a reason not to move forward with the demand curve. We think it's a reason to have a lot more meetings on the demand curve. Uh, next slide, please. So the next one I wanted to talk about gets a little wonky. So I'm just gonna do this at, at the highest level. Um, the CAISO was really good at presenting um, some of the more detailed settlement issues on the IRP to FRP, but I think additional trans, uh, transparency is needed at what that means at kind of the policy level. You know, what are we trying to do um, when we're translating IRP to FRP? And is the way the CAISO is proposing to do it um, fair and equitable, basically. Um, I, I didn't wanna get into this because this could be two hours in and of itself, but if you guys go to the final proposal and you read through you know, how the settlements work, um, in particular, how virtuals and load are settled, um, it's gonna change after DAME. And I know it wasn't super clear to me that virtuals were gonna have a different settlement after DAME as compared to now. And I think it's something worth highlighting. Um, there's, you know, I, I think George uh, addresses this um, and he just posted a, a response to SEE's presentation yesterday. And we started to touch on that virtual issue and how that settlement will happen. And it made me realize, you know, when you use words like um, virtuals will be settled on forecasted movement. That's not um, a policy level discussion. That's not inherently clear, I think, um, what that means from a practical perspective in terms of incenting virtuals and price signals. And um, so I think we should talk about that more. Um, and then the last thing I think we need uh, more discussions about, again, pre perk filing, is how uh, the VER participation and must offer rules um, need, uh, or just how they work. I think they need to be clarified. Um, VERS, for example, don't have, RA VERS don't have a, a, real, a day ahead must offer obligation. Um, they don't have to bid into day ahead, but it sounds like they are going to have to bid in to the IRP product. It's also a little weird to think about VERS covering their own uncertainty. So you're allocating uncertainty to them and then you're saying, oh, they could also meet it. There's just some odd things there that I, I think it would be worth clarifying and discussing um, what the CAISO intends. This is laid out in the final proposal. I just don't think it's quite clear enough. Next slide. Finally, um, I wanted to talk about the mosaic quantile. There we go. Okay. Uh, so mosaic quantile regression methodology. I think this is a discussion that could happen after the FERC filing. So I didn't want to hit it too hard, but Kathleen talked a lot about it yesterday. So I wanted just to make sure to level set and that everyone was on the same page. So um, the mosaic quantile regression sounds um, very technical and maybe um, a, a little bit much, but really um, all it is is a quantile regression which just is a way of saying um, as solar output or wind output or load changes, 
um, you get a different likelihood of uncertainty. And so it's really nice because if you just think about it from a high level, as there's a lot of solar output and you're towards your Pmax, you're not gonna get a lot of un solar uncertainty, not between the day ahead in real time and not between the RTPD and the RTD because solar is already toward its max output. It can't go higher than its Pmax. So you know there's not gonna be a lot of uncertainty. Um, likewise, when solar is producing really low, um, it's probably cloudy out and you're not gonna get as much uncertainty from it. Um, so all the quantile regression does is it acknowledges that fact, that fact in a statistical way. So really just a, a better way um, of qualifying things that are variable based on weather. Um, so it's really good, for example, at solar. It's, it's less good at wind. Um, and it's not so great at when you aggregate it all together at um, net load forecasting. So what the CAISO did is they said, OK, we're not going to run a quantile regression on the net load. Um, we're going to break it out. And that's what mosaic means. It just means they look at the solar independently, the wind independently, and the load independently. And I get into all of this because there's actually some real world implications on, on how they do this that apply both to the frameworks um, and will ultimately apply to the requirement. So one consequence of this kind of variability based on you know, these independent weather variables is that you can see wide swings from um, interval to interval or hour to hour. You can go from zero to the cap really quickly. And in real time, that doesn't matter so much because it's just a small requirement. But in day ahead, if we have a 4,000 megawatt requirement and we're going from zero in one hour, and then the IRP jumps up to 4,000 in the next hour, that's a lot of ramp. And maybe we don't want to procure that much ramp. That's a, and that is a function of the statistical methodology. Um, another thing that you know, I, I think we should talk about is whether, you know, not just how to smooth it, but perhaps um, whether we want to actually cap it at the 99th percentile or not. Um, so I don't really think, not proposing we change how the CAISO does their methodology or creates their function, but I am saying we should talk about the real world implications on it and as a group kind of agree, maybe there are ways to make it less choppy. Um, the next thing that kind of is an implication of the mosaic um, is that you know they do forecast that solar component separately. Right now they're doing it at a system level, but you could do it at a zonum level. So you would be able to, with the, the same methodology, pull out P nodes in different zones and actually statistically articulate the differences in uncertainty. And the CAISO already has that methodology in place and Hong can create it, I'm sure 20 million times better than I ever could, but it does lend itself to actually being broken up zonally in a, in a pretty rigorous way. Um, so we believe that you know this doesn't need to be done day one, but there are, are certainly opportunities for enhancements here, whether you go down the nodal or the zonal path. Next slide, please. All right, so level setting. And uh, one more slide. All right, so this is just level setting because I tend to, anyone who's heard me speak, I tend to use shorthand. I like policy discussions. I think it's really hard to speak in technical language, but um, I wanna be pretty clear about our position. So I'm gonna try and um, articulate more what I mean when I say certain words. So when we say that we support the evaluation of a zonal framework, I'm actually using shorthand. Um, zonal framework is shorthand for any of the frameworks that could possibly be designed to reflect constraints somewhere between a BAA level and a nodal level. Um, Vistra yesterday presented on one option and we've been talking with the uh, market surveillance committee. I think Scott Harvey said he was up to 10 different ideas he had. I don't think he's gonna present on all 10. I don't know, he might, but he has a lot of different ideas on how a zonal framework could work. But the zonal framework doesn't mean a single framework. We're not advocating for anything specific at this point in time. We're just saying we believe in general, there are other design ideas that are worthwhile. And um, the next thing gets back to the uncertainty requirement. You know, I just went through the, the mosaic quantile regression and how that leads to an uncertainty requirement. You know, I, I'm just using that generally as, as shorthand and we'll continue to use it in our comments as shorthand for the CAISO statistical function that's based on a system forecast, or maybe it'll be based on, on a different forecast at some point in time. But there is really no specific one requirement the CAISO is setting. It is a, a function based on weather or ultimately a forecast. Um, so I just wanted to make that clear because I know there was some confusion last time I talked and there's a little bit of uproar. There is no requirement. I understand it's a function. It's not a requirement. But it's much easier to talk in terms of what's the uncertainty requirement. 
Um, the, the next thing I want to level set on is something that SCE touched on yesterday. And I, I thought Jeff brought up a lot of great points. But one thing I, I want to make clear that we strongly disagree with is we do not believe, nor do I think anyone should, um, is that the IRP is a successor to ROC. A successor literally means to succeed. It follows. It takes over from. Um, ROC's core functionality should be maintained. ROC's core functionality should be maintained. Jeff Nelson, did you just call me to interrupt this speech? <laughs> I bet you did. No, I'm just joking. Um, he, he only might do something like that. Um, okay, so I, I'm going to start over because this is a really important point. IRP is not a successor to ROC. Um, ROC's core functionality under any of the proposals being described will be maintained today. And it's the out of market action to address uncertainty that's going to be moved in market via the IRP. None of uh, ROC's core functionality is going to be moved. Um, into the IRP. And that's really important for RA contracting. Um, and I know that's a slightly separate discussion, but if you have RA contracts that claw back a portion of a co-optimized product, you then change the supplier's willingness to provide that product and you give them incentives to bid in a way that's outside the market structure. And you don't want to do that. You want generators to respond to, within energy market signals. Otherwise, you introduce externalities and all sorts of issues into the market. Great example of that is VERS, right? How VERS bid is because of an outside contract that they have. Um, we ideally don't want to break this contract before it starts, and we want to you know, keep it clean and just acknowledge up front that IRP is a co-optimized energy product, or you could say our co-optimized capacity product, but it's co-optimized in the market. It is not a successor to ROC. ROC core functionality will be maintained. All right. Next slide. And this is my last section before I'm gonna hand it over to Callie to do the comparison. Oh, is this my last section? No, I have one more. Okay, just kidding, I have one more section. Um, okay, so here's a little bit of initiative history. I thought for uh, those of you who um, haven't been going on this fun ride with us for the last five years, um, the CAISO's original design um, was actually a zonal framework and that's how it was for the first two years of the initiative. And the reason you know, why we switched to nodal was based on issues with the FRP. But originally, um, the idea was to use sub-regional constraints to ensure deliverability. And there was this contemplation of a deliverability assessment tools for operators to see if new sub-regions um, needed to be enforced. So what we've been proposing um, has really just been a kind of a callback to what was already proposed you know, um, for the first two years of the initiative. And we understand that FRP had its issues. And I went over this a little bit last presentation, but I wanna hit it a little bit harder today on why we actually believe that, you know, FRP is not really that analogous to IRP. So FRP was a system-wide or BAA level requirement. Um, it's also priced based on opportunity cost and procured in real time to meet real time conditions. Basically you have the same transmission constraints enforced and similar outage patterns. Um, so we believe the trade-offs for FRP are also not the same as for IRP, simply because the day-ahead market is also a financial market. It's not a physical market. Next slide, please. So a little bit more background. Um, and I'm really excited. Uh, maybe Guillermo will talk about this later. But so um, they have gone nodal, and we are going to see some um, data on this at the next market performance and planning forum. So, you know, when the FRP was first implemented, the goal was to reduce HASP operator bias. And we haven't seen that happen yet. Um, and one of the reasons why we thought we didn't see that happen was because it wasn't procuring um, meaningful amounts of FRP because a lot of it was stuck behind a constraint. So I think the theory was operators still weren't comfortable with the product. So now we have um, a nodal product and hopefully that will mean operators are comfortable with it. If they're not, I think we need to ask ourselves, why are operators still biasing? Um, is it because of this net load uncertainty? Is it for a different reason? Because if it is for a different reason, I think that has implications on the IRP design. Because one of the main goals is to stop them from biasing so much in ROC. So going back a little bit, um, you know, the, the FRP has opportunity cost pricing, and that has um, some pretty significant implications when you start talking about IRP where you're allowed to bid, particularly as it refers to VERS. So generally, um, if a resource doesn't have an opportunity cost with energy, 
then it's the cheapest resource to award FRP. So that means if an energy offer is really high, or if you're behind a constraint and you're unable to provide energy, you look really cheap to provide FRP, even though you're behind a constraint and you can't actually provide it. Um, so this is one of the issues that hopefully will be resolved in nodal um, and could be resolved in other ways under the zonal frameworks. And again, um, maybe Guillermo, I don't know if he's in here. I can't actually see. Yeah, um, Guillermo, I hopefully later you could talk about um, the MPPF, what you're gonna present, because um, I'm very excited for that. Okay, next slide, please. Oh yeah, Becky. Well, I have a question about if you want to uh, just on the last point you made, if now's a good time. Or yeah, I'm actually gonna um, go over that again on this slide. So yeah, so I'll, I'll run through this and uh, so um, this top bullet is you know the the Kaiso's justification um, for keeping IRP and FRP um, having a very similar design. You know, they said it's procured in the same way for the same reasons. There's no difference between biddable or not biddable. Doesn't matter whether it's day ahead market or real time market. And you know, this may be true from an engineering perspective, but I don't believe it's true from a market perspective. Um, so first of all, when you start talking about, you know, I'll just start with the opportunity cost design. You know, procurement from VERS behind a constraint um, under the opportunity cost methodology is almost inevitable because they look like they're free. But procurement of VERS behind a constraint, if they have a very high IRP bid, um, they're much less likely to be awarded IRP because they have a high bid. And VERS are not going to want to be awarded IRP. VERS are literally paid on how much they produce. They also have contractual minimums. So if you have a contractual minimum as a VER, you're not gonna wanna risk being held back for uncertainty. Um, that, that's just very unlikely. So we think there is likely a difference that will happen just in the inherent bidding practices of VERS that will make them one, less likely to be awarded behind when they're behind a constraint, but also make them less likely to be awarded period. And we also think, you know, the zonal constraints could accommodate, you know, wind behind a known constraint. There's ways to do that as well. But just from a market perspective, I just want to illustrate that bidding does matter. I um, mean, it does lead to a different resource set being procured for IRP compared to FRP. And I'll pause there because I have other points, but I think that's the point Becky had a question on. Hey, thanks, Carrie. Becky Robinson with the ISO. I, I just wanted to, to tease out more your point where on the last slide you, you mentioned that, right, these resources that are behind constraints, they look cheap from the optimization. And so that was a, a key problem that, um, that folks saw with FRP before the nodal enhancements is that it was sort of, it's like a chronic problem to opt optimization that, um, you know, that resources that are, that, that can't be dispatched up for energy because they're behind constraints, they look cheap to provide um, imbalanced reserves. And so then it, it, it begets this journey of, well, how do you, how do you make this optimization see that they can't actually provide it? And, and you mentioned um, a minute ago that perhaps there's different ways of addressing that in a zonal approach. And I just would love to hear more of, of your ideas of how, how you would do that. Uh, if um, to resolve approach. Yeah, thanks, Becky. Um, so there's a, a couple different ways you could do it. Um, SPP, for example, sees the same issue because VERS are often, you know, out in a very constrained area. So this, you know, is not a Kaiso specific problem. And they're considering actually disqualifying VERS from providing their product. You know, if you take a step back and you think for environmental purposes, we're trying to meet these GHG goals as a state, you know, as a region, west wide carbon goals now. Do we really want to hold back VERS um, in favor of another resource or do account for uncertainty? So you could have that policy debate and say, just eliminate them. And they're the resources most likely behind a constraint. You also could say, as Kathleen was talking about the different cut planes, you know, in English, a, a cut plane just means you're going to group different P nodes by different zones. And you're going to say you have minimums and maximums between it. And there are different ways to address it that way. Um, I think Scott Harvey actually has some other ideas about how to address this, and he's going to get into it at the MPPF, um, but it's not um, an all or nothing kind of question. It's how much 
um, kind of uncertainty are you willing to live with? How often is this a problem? How much of it is going to be solved naturally by bidding high? How much could it be solved naturally by VERS being disqualified? So I just think there's a, a wide range of solutions possible. Thanks. That that's helpful. I appreciate you kind of like sharing the the landscape there. I think that's you know it's a great point about um, about VERS and and a question of whether we want to be holding them back, um, you know, by providing reserve various reserve down products. Uh, it, it strikes me that it, you know it's a little bit of a separate conversation, but but just to uh, you know the conversation about do we need down products? Um, if you if you assume that you can dispatch down VERS, you know, as much as you need to, because they have economic offers or, or, you know, for other reasons, for that and other reasons, then there's no oversupply problem, right? <laughs> I mean, like, and so the whole, the whole notion of over, over, uh, oversupply um, sort of presumes that we want, we want all that output and we want to be able to dispatch the rest of the fleet around that and manage them that way. Um, so I think that is a really interesting point and interesting conversation. And, and right, I, you mentioned SPP, but I, I saw that MISO actually filed at FERC um, just last week about disqualifying VERS from providing ramp down. Um, so that'll be an interesting space to watch. I, you know, when I saw that, I was curious um, whether in the KISO experience, whether it is mainly VERS that are behind constraints where we saw that problem materialize or whether it is other types of generation resources as well, right? Because it's, um, and I don't know if, if Guillermo wants to speak to that now, or if that's sort of something we can take back and and look at more to kind of cut through by resource type, but um, I think it's an interesting question given given your point about what other markets are thinking about. Yeah, thanks, Becky. Yeah, we would love to see that data. Um, you know, all, all we have is aggregate data right now, and it, and it's pretty um, hard to interpret at some time. So yeah, more data is better. Completely agree, Becky. Um, okay, so then um, moving on from the ver. Oh, another. Yep. Um, hi, Gary. This is Thanks, George Angelis. Uh, yeah. So, um, why are you saying that the verse are not going to be um, willing to provide the services? I mean, the the marginal price for the service is really capturing the opportunity cost in the sense that they would be indifferent whether they provide energy or capacity. Um, Maybe the exception of renewable energy credits, I don't know how that works, but uh, in terms of pricing, this should be indifferent. Um, and having the ability to provide the service, they actually can hedge their own uncertainty because they're allocated uh, some cost for imbalance reserve. And if you can provide your own imbalance reserve, you can hedge your own uncertainty, you can cover some or maybe all of that cost through your payments for availability. I'm, I'm just saying. Yeah, no, um, I, I think this is, that is a great question. I think the reason why I'm saying that has nothing to do with the KISO optimization. It has to do with how VERS are contracted. And when they contract, they actually have minimums that they have to meet. Um, they actually can't go over a certain amount and they can't go under a certain amount without contractual penalties. And the minimums aren't like a price that you could then you know, bid into the market. They are strict contractual minimums that cause all sorts of other huge implications that VERS will never violate. You can kind of think of it um, similar to the KISO's problem that you had with um, storage grid charging. There's just something external to the KISO that doesn't really make sense from a pure energy economic optimization perspective that is causing resources to behave in a certain way. So VERS are, are one of them. And you know it's why uh, another great example is VERS don't really bid 100% in the day ahead market or even up near their forecast, uh, wind in particular, even though the day ahead market price is higher. It's irrational, right? But it's rational because of how their contracts are structured. So I'm saying this because of the intersection of contracts and, and energy markets. Okay, so we assume that uh, you know they will self-schedule the minimum requirement based on the contract. Now, if you have this, ah, uh, wait, sorry, George, you know, you know you're getting I mean? to another contractual issue, which is who pays for the resource if it's self-scheduled versus economically bid, and then it's curtailed. And so you can't just assume a ver will self-schedule because different people pay for it, or different parties will pay for that ver based on whether there's a self-schedule curtailment or an economic curtailment. 
So you can't just assume the verb will then self-schedule it, it, its way out of it, because in some instances, they may not get paid if they're curtailed and they're self-scheduled versus an economic offer. Anyway, please continue. After this, I can't say anything. <laughs> so Carrie, yeah. there is a question on the phone line. Yeah, please. Okay. Go to Michelle and then to James in the room. Terry, can we go back to slide? Hey, could we go back to slide 11? Uh, let's see. I think it's 11. It was about the must offer. So it was your last point that IRP, sorry, 11. Um, your last point that IRP is not a successor to Ruck. Um, so one thing is, you know, when we buy these contracts, um, resource adequacy contracts, they have a must offer into the real time and IRP is just a must offer into the real time. So from my perspective, that looks a lot like something we're already paying for. So I think I disagree with you about this. So maybe I don't think maybe we disagree as, as much as you think. So I agree that flexible RA contracts already have an economic must offer into the real time. Um, I don't agree that it's a successor to rock. And it's a nuanced point because I, I know that, you know, most contracts, 99.9% .9 of contracts say that if you're an RA resource, you have to bid into ROC at zero, but then you're allowed to self-schedule that output. And there's, there's a lot of different nuance there. Um, but I completely agree that um, flexible RA already puts this must offer um, on resources. Um, and I also think this doesn't, add too much compared to the RA program. So from a, a KISO lens, um, you should be getting, you know, all your economic um, must offer into the real time anyway that you need. I think where this helps is in committing long starts um, and day ahead. And then I think it helps you better set up transfers between EIM areas. But I completely agree that the flexible RA, um, you're already paying for that real time must offer. Okay, but with regard to long starts, I mean, other than the OTCs, what long starts are you talking about? Oh, the OTCs, I mean, they are long starts, but there's a lot of other long starts in the system. And um, the latest I saw was that the KISO commits something of, on average 300 megawatts of PMIN energy of long starts that are non-OTC. Um, this is an average. So when you look at stress days, it gets higher. And then obviously that's just PMIN capacity. So the PMAX and aggregate is a lot higher. Um, but yeah, there, there isn't a lot that could be committed um, in a specific region. But again, I think all that changes as we expand into EDAM. Okay, and then I just wanted to just say one thing. I mean, if we're, what we're trying to do is trying to move the uncertainty out of rock into the day ahead market. I mean, when I looked at, um, I think it was George, I mean, I don't know whose analysis it was before, I saw the uncertainty at basically 4,000 megawatts pretty much every hour, but that's really not how the, operators are intervening in the market ruck. I mean, the uncertainty that they're putting on is really during the net load hours. And that seems more about exports. And I'm not sure that this solves that. So I, I um, yeah, it doesn't seem to track with what operators are doing at all. You know, this is kind of extraneous to anything in the presentation, but okay. since you brought it up, I'll just say, I, I actually agree with you. Um, I, I think that perhaps um, the KISO and maybe even stakeholders have not done a good job in saying how does the requirement track with existing operator bias for net load uncertainty and how can we be you know, um, confident that it's going to reduce the operator bias without overburdening you know, costs and other hours. I think that's a, a very legitimate point and one that FERC will be really interested in and one I hope the KISO addresses. Um, I, well, it it did touch on your presentation because you're sa you're saying it won't have succeeded if we don't take at if we aren't addressing the operator intervention. So that's what I was getting at there. So yeah. sorry, thanks. No, no, it's all right. I'm I am actually happy to talk about that point because I think it's a great point. Um, yeah, I I think one. I'm just going to take a little small deviation and say it's our understanding that um, the KISO provides the high confidence forecast to operators today, and then they kind of feel free to bias up to that amount. Um, and so really operator bias isn't just a function of their experience. It's a function of the forecast they're given today by the KISO that kind of allows them to go up to a certain point without maybe scrutiny. So I think one of the key things that the KISO should do 
is one, change what they give the operators to really address net load uncertainty and make really clear within their own operator bias processes what they need. So that's on the operator side. And then on the other side, when we're talking about the requirement, I think it's totally fair to ask, do we need a requirement an hour or two in the spring? We have a lot of flex natural hydro runoff flexibility. You know, do we actually need this in every hour? Um, and maybe if we don't need it, maybe it's not binding and it's a zero dollar price. But if it's not a zero dollar price, I, I think that's a, a fair criticism um, on, you know, shaping it hourly or perhaps not even, you know, activating it hourly. Okay, Carol, this is from Kai, so can I make a couple of comments? The first one, we have indeed provided the analysis of how the Atlantic Surf and the rock adjustment have played. We, we have posted a dedicated analysis for the DIM where we actually have a series of metrics and analysis regarding the comparison, the correlation between the imbalance reserve proposed versus the rock adjustments that the operators have been doing. And we elaborate the reasons we actually, for the summer report, I don't know you took a look at that, but we actually provided the breakdown as the reasons that make up that specific megawatt value of the rock bias in the summer conditions. So all that information is out there. So I'm not so sure we are connecting the dots here. I, so I think I, if we're talking about the same report, I think the issue is that when we look at the requirement and we look at that report, they seem uncorrelated. We had that conversation with James as well in a prior meeting. And so when you're asking us to support a requirement that's uncorrelated with operator bias, I think Michelle's pointing out that there's a piece missing there. And I'm not saying that it, it won't work or and we're very supportive of this product. I just think it's it's reasonable to point out there's a, a gap there. Yeah, and I think we have discussed actually this in previous rounds of the DIM. So let me step back a little bit on, on the background on this because this is part of what the discussions we have had in the past. The first one is that you indicated that it's kind of arbitrary how the operators are making the rock adjustment. That is not the case, that is not correct. Uh, we have indicated that over the years, we have evolved how operators put the rock adjustments into the market. Yes, if you look at five, six years ago, it was kind of judge based and they put a number and you may see a different number the day after and so on. Over the years, we have tried to provide more science behind the, the guidance and the current approach that we can see, and that is publicly available on Oasis. You can see that there are specific rock adjustments through a series of hours and they are not 500, 1,000 increments. They are very precise because there is a calculation behind those. So they are not longer driven specifically by only operator judgments. The confidence bands that we provide is indeed one of the components that make up the rock adjustments. It's not the only one. There is the other component of intra-hour ramp capability for the solar and so on. These are the breakdowns that we actually provided in the summer report. And you can have that sample of the four or five days that we illustrate out of the 8,000, 9,000 megawatts of rock, what is making up this requirement? So the information is there. Now, the discussion we have in the previous rounds of the team was regarding how well the rock adjustments correlate to the imbalance reserve. Well, we are comparing apples to oranges at that point, right? Because we are not in the place where the operators right now have all the sophistication to make this type of judgment. The confidence bands is only one of the information that goes into the, into the calculation. When we talk about the confidence bands versus the regular imbalance reserve that is based on uncertainty, we are really talking about different setups. We are providing a guidance to operators what is the most extreme case under similar conditions, under similar weather conditions of how bad it could be, right? Is the extreme case, if you name it, is the 100% case versus the imbalance reserve that takes into account a historical reference of 180 days, takes many other factors in consideration, is the composition of the wind load solar. So there is also another component that we have indicated that beyond the uncertainty, there are other conditions, reliability conditions that operators have to factor in. If they know they have a fire burning on their transmission line, they have to hedge for that. If there is a contingency happening, they, they need that, they need to hedge for that. These are components that are beyond the uncertainty, but it still plays a role how the operators need to secure capacity for positioning the system for the real time. Uh, and I think we have that discussion a, a couple of times in the in the team process. So this is not really a brand new topic in, in the discussion. 
Yeah, I, I think I just want to make sure though, um, we're at least talking apples to apples and that you understand the concern is that we hear you that it's apples to oranges, but we also know operators are biasing for uncertainty and for other items. I think we're all okay with continuing rock bias for wildfires and for whatever other non-uncertainty reasons. I think what we want though is for that uncertainty portion to be taken out and put into the requirement and then to know that that feedback loop will occur and that operators then will not bias anymore for uncertainty or at least to just you know significantly reduce the amount they're going to bias and I think it's that maybe it is because it's apples to oranges but I think it's that last feedback loop that we're kind of missing and so maybe you know, everything you said is really helpful. And I think just since the final proposal, our understanding has, has leaped dramatically, but I still, it's that, it's that final feedback loop. If the, how will that requirement then lead to less operator biasing that we're missing? And what information will the operators get? You know, in addition to what they're getting today, or are you gonna take away information? So maybe that we could just talk about that more, you know, not today, um, but at the MPPF or another meeting. Continuing on, next slide. Nope, I think that was the last slide. Keep on going. One more. Oh, one back. Did I finish up this slide? I can't remember now. Oh, I'm midway through, sorry, 14. Okay, midway through. Oh, IRP, FRP, all right, level setting. We are now once again talking about how IRP is different than FRP. And I think I'm on that second bullet. So one big difference um, in my world in particular as a consultant um, between the day ahead and the real-time price is what that day ahead price is used for. The day ahead price um, outside the CAISO, um, in particular the congestion component, drives investment and in generation in particular locations. Within the CAISO processes, it drives transmission build out. So um, when you start talking about the accuracy of price signals, it's really important to get that day ahead ac nodal price signal accurate in the day ahead in ways that it's just not quite as important in the real time. You know, you're not gonna build a transmission line based on real time prices. You're gonna look at the day ahead prices. So that's, that's a big difference. Um, the next one is the accuracy of the nodal price signals changes based on how well uncertainty materializes not RTPD to RTD, like in real time, but between the day ahead forecast and real time. And that's a big jump in time. That's also a, a different model that's run, different transmission constraints are enforced, um, you know, different outages happen between day ahead and real time. So there's just a bigger change um, between day ahead and real time than RTPD and RTD. So we view um, that, you know, this is a, a significant difference between IRP and FRP. And I'll note this, this could be exacerbated by FERC 881 dynamic line rating changes. Um, we have yet to see, you know, how that will really impact um, things in real time in terms of constraints, but it could have a, a large impact. Then my last point is that virtual participation and just generally financial products meaningfully change day ahead market considerations compared to real time market considerations. In real time, you don't have to think about CRR settlements. You don't have to think about, um, you know, how you're going to incent virtuals versus physical bids. Um, in day ahead, you do have to think about those things because they're they're part of the day ahead market and they're an important piece. All right, next slide, please. All right, now this is my last topic. One more slide. So this is our, our quick benchmarking framework. Um, and you know, I think for time considerations, once again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip over this so we can get to Cali. Um, but I'll just note, you know, you could read through these things, but in, in our opinion, at a high level, if you look at a nodal framework versus a zonal framework, you have different considerations on how well they meet the different goals um, or issues that Dame is trying to resolve. Um, but they all can meet them. And they're all different design elements that you wanna trade off between. Um, but it's not like, you know, one improves day ahead price formation and one doesn't, or one captures EDM diversity benefits or one doesn't. I think there was actually a little bit of confusion on that one yesterday. Um, you know, the diversity benefits can be reduced in different ways between the nodal and zonal framework um, and, and Vistra presented on one way to do it. But in general, any 
you know, zonal design that uh, WPTF would support. And I would say any rational uh, zonal design would still allow you to capture the diversity benefits. That's a huge part of um, our market going forward. Um, so when you go through all of these, we do think it's worthwhile to continue the comparison, which is what Kelly is going to do. Thanks, everyone. I have the same issue. I'm too short and you can't see me behind the podium. So I apologize for that. Um, okay, so I wanted to talk more about just kind of uh, comparing certain design elements between a nodal and a zonal framework. Um, we're not gonna touch on all of them. There's a lot of design elements to compare between the two and they all have very similar design elements, but it's how are they implemented? How are they designed? And then kind of think through the trickle down, trickle down effects, because depending on how you design a certain market element in one framework versus the other might have different implications and pricing is gonna be one of them that we really hit on. Um, so I'm gonna focus mostly on two, maybe three, um, what we call kind of the, the main design elements that kind of have the biggest differences between the two zonal frameworks, because that's the whole purpose of these workshops, right? Let's talk about the trade-offs. Let's really get our, wrap our minds around what trade-offs are we having to make between the two, what are we comfortable with um, and what we aren't. And so that hopefully is where we get at by the end of today. Um, one, so when I think about zonal versus nodal, um, you can actually envision a whole spectrum, right? There's a whole range of possible frameworks between the two. And actually I might go a little bit even higher level and it's nodal to system. And as you kind of visually move from system down to nodal, the main difference that you're seeing is, well, how many more constraints are we actually directly modeling in the frameworks? I think that's one of the biggest differences between the two. Um, and as you move along that spectrum, then there's all these different market design elements underneath that they also kind of move along and, and change diff in different ways um, between those two endpoints of like a system framework versus a nodal. So hopefully that's what we're gonna get at today. Um, let's see. And I think, yeah, the main one, so, um, the main one that we're going to hit on is probably prices. Is that the first one, prices initially? Um, and so when you think about it, as you go more nodal, you're going to see more granular prices. You're going to have to have more granular distribution of the uncertainty requirements. And that's going to have some pricing implications um, and then as well as procurement implications that we'll talk about. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so... These are kind of the, the six grouping of comparisons I want to do. I'm really going to focus in mostly on the first four. Um, depending on time, we might get into the fifth and the sixth element. But I think, um, obviously, depending on time, feel free to go back, look at the slides if we don't get through all of them in much detail. Um, okay, so let's start with an overview of the uncertainty distribution under a nodal framework. And the reason I want to spend a little bit more time on this and really talk through it is I think yesterday there was a little bit of a confusion between how the uncertainty distribution works under a nodal framework versus a zonal. Um, so this is our understanding of what is being proposed in the nodal framework. Um, and so I want to make sure we all have a, a very clear understanding of this because this is what impacts potentially inefficient procurement and inefficient price signals that we're gonna talk about in the next, when we start kind of comparing the frameworks. Um, so under a nodal, under the nodal framework, it does require what we talked about yesterday's deployment scenarios. And essentially what the KAISA is doing is they will set that uncertainty requirement. They'll reduce it by some sort of diversity benefit. And then they're gonna take that and use these low distribution factors and solar and wind forecasts. And they're gonna distribute that uncertainty requirement down to those nodes and essentially in the deployment scenarios it's going to say okay let's assume that uncertainty materializes let's make sure that the resources we've awarded uncertainty products to whether it's up or down can actually be delivered and meet where we think that uncertainty requirement is actually going to materialize um, <laughs> zonal frameworks in one way could use i'm going to very vaguely uncertain or deployment scenarios as well um, but they're a little bit less precise. You don't have to go all the way down to the nodal level. Um, you can do some um, high level deployment, quote unquote, deployment scenarios to really test transfer capability if 
if that's the framework that you wanted to go to. Obviously, you can um, create more zones without considering any transfer capability, or you can go fully system. Um, but there is the option under a zonal framework to at least model some sort of transmission constraints. So it's not like we're completely throwing that out um, off the table entirely. Um, so under the nodal framework, we think of, you know, there's five steps in getting from setting the requirement down to these deployment scenarios. And it's these last two that I have here bolded um, that really are the different elements between a zonal and a nodal framework. So next slide, please. Okay, so this is just visual representation. I'm not gonna go into detail. I think I might've pulled this from one of the KISO slides. I just added the red text here. So this is the KISO's market processes when they're running the day ahead market. So they start by collecting input data. They run, it's stuck, but really think about this as the IFM market optimization, but they're ignoring all transmission constraints. They're kind of setting up what are the initial schedules that we're gonna have all the products, energy, AS, and the IR products. Then they take those awards and they put them into a power flow. And the power flow sees, okay, are these deliverable now that we overlay transmission constraints on them? If they're not, it kind of feedbacks back and forth between SCUC and the NA until it converges, meaning until the awards that the resources are receiving in the SCUC optimization um, doesn't violate any transmission constraints as it goes back and forth between the NA and the SCUC. But what I really want you guys to focus on is where the uncertainty or under the nodal design where each of those steps that I just listed in the, pre in the previous slide actually take place. So obviously, we're gonna set the requirements ahead of time. That's an input data. Um, the first run of SCUC is where you're gonna get the procurement of IR, not the final procurement, but just kind of, just based on the bids, no transmission constraints, what resources are gonna be awarded the product. And then it's in this NA step where that distribution occurs. So it's where you're gonna take the requirement from the first step, and you're gonna distribute it down to the nodes. Um, and then you're gonna basically take the awards from the SCUC run and deploy those. Can they actually then be delivered to where you're expecting that uncertainty materialize? So again, just a, a visual representation of where each of those steps take place when the KISA is actually running the IFM. Next slide, please. Okay, this is extremely illustrative. I know this is much more complex um, in reality when they go to actually distribute the uncertainty, but I think we wanted to start here so that you guys can really understand some of the uh, potential implications with going nodal. Um, so at the very highest level, the KAIS is gonna come up with an uncertainty requirement. In this example, we have upward uncertainty. Let's say it's 30 megawatts, I know that's extremely low. They're gonna take that and they're gonna say, okay, 10 megawatts is attributed to solar, 20 megawatts is attributed to wind uncertainty. And they're going to then distribute that to the solar resources and the wind resources on the system when they distribute that uncertainty requirement um, for the deployment scenarios. And here, what's gonna happen is they're gonna distribute, for example, the 10 megawatts of solar based on the forecast of each solar resource. This is not based on the estimated uncertainty of the resource, it is just based on their forecast um, in a pro rata fashion and same for wind. Next slide, please. Okay, so while that sounds great, it's pro rata fashion distribution down to the solar resources. What one of the biggest implications it has is it does not take into account any variation and uncertainty based on location of the resource. In other words, a solar resource that has a 50 megawatt forecast in the Bay Area is gonna have the same uncertainty requirement, or sorry, the same amount of the uncertainty distributed down to it as a solar resource in Bakersfield. For those of you who don't know Bakersfield, I don't recommend visiting there. <laughs> it's really hot year round. Um, not a lot of uncertainty is gonna occur in Bakersfield, especially in the summer. But based on how they're distributing that uncertainty, it's going to assume that the market needs to procure enough upward imbalance reserve to meet the same amount of uncertainty as a solar resource on the coast than in the, in the valley or in Bakersfield. So in our example, if it was that 20 megawatt of solar, um, and 20 megawatts of solar that needed to be distributed, 10 megawatts would go to Bay Area, 10 megawatts would go to Bakersfield. And the market is gonna procure under a nodal design, making sure that wherever it procures the imbalance reserve up, 
10 megawatts can reach Bakersfield and 10 megawatts can reach that solar, that solar resource in the Bay Area. But in reality, we know that is an inaccurate assumption. We know that there's probably gonna be a lot more uncertainty in the Bay Area than in Bakersfield. So if, for example, reality, it's more of a 16-4 megawatt split instead of a 10-10, um, the question is, now we've done the nodal deployment, we've procured the resources, now we can realize that we've possibly over procured capacity to meet uncertainty in Bakersfield. So when real time comes around, the biggest question is, now that we've potentially over procured, can that capacity that was deliverable to Bakersfield now reach the Bay Area? If it can, okay. If it can't, we've now over procured and we sent the wrong market signals. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Ah, yes, that's much louder. <laughs> um, you know, I, what's my next slide? Do you mind what it, I, yeah, let me, do you mind, it's, I think, still on the distribution. Okay, okay, so yeah, so this next slide is, um, how would you do this differently under a zonal approach? And I think yesterday there was a lot of um, conversation around this and maybe a little bit of confusion on how you would distribute uncertainty under a zonal approach versus a nodal. And very, very high level, in my mind, both of them are a top-down approach. None of them are a bottom-up approach. Um, both of them can reflect the diversity benefit. So what you would do is you would take the same requirement that Kaiso is forecasting for the nodal approach. I mean, you could take the exact same requirement under a zonal approach. Both of them already reflect that diversity benefit. The difference is under the nodal approach, you're going to take that BA level diverse or BA level uncertainty amount and distribute it all the way down to the nodes. Whereas a zonal, you take that BA level uncertainty amount and you just bucket it into different zones. Not as granular, you don't go near as far down in terms of granularity. Um, I know that's very high level, but that is the main difference in my mind. It's not, I don't see it, and maybe I'm missing something, um, but yesterday there was conversation about under a zonal framework, you still have to somehow distribute it all the way down to the nodes and then back up. Um, I don't think that's the case. I think you can very easily distribute it just down to zonals, um, just down to a couple zones and not go all the way down and back up. Um, so I think that's, yeah, that's the main point on that one. So I'll go ahead and take the, the question on the phone. Okay, let's go ahead and unmute Michelle. Hey, this is Michelle. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna totally betray my misunderstanding about this. So. Um, you're, you're saying that you're distributing the uncertainty requirement, and let's say you distribute it to a solar that's in a constrained area, and then you go procure it, but that's not really what matters, right? It's really whether the resource is deliverable to load. So I'm kind of confused about this. Yeah, that's a great question. So if it is a solar resource and it has an upward uncertainty requirement distributed to it in the deployment scenarios. I know that's not saying it's a requirement of upward uncertainty to be procured at that location, but it's can what we procure meet that level of upward uncertainty at that solar resource. Um, it's actually modeled in George, correct me if I'm wrong, it's modeled as an increase in load mm -hmm. in the actual deployment scenarios. But we don't, uh, an increase in load near that area, I mean, so I, I guess I'm confused. So if we distribute the uncertainty, let, let's say there's a very constrained solar area, it's certain, we distribute the, sol the uncertainty there, but let's say there's a resource right near load that can serve load. I'm confused about what we're doing here. Michelle, this is, this is Carrie. I, I, I see what you mean and it's the, it's the technical being translated into the policy. You're right. And we don't need capacity procured in Bakersfield to be deliverable to that, that solar plant in the Bay Area. But we know that we were assuming we, we have sufficient capacity to meet Bay Area load. And if there's a constraint between the Bay Area, a transmission constraint between the Bay Area and Bakersfield, now we've over procured in Bakers for Bakersfield and under procured in Bay Area. But we are talking about in real time, yes, delivering to load, not delivering to a supply area. So we're just saying, did we set up our resources appropriately and day ahead to meet real time load? But if you distribute the uncertainty to the 
is uh, maybe I'm just, I mean, maybe I'm missing something. Mm, maybe let's take this offline. Maybe I could walk through an example with you later. It might help. Okay, let's go to Stuart Kelly. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, just, just a quick question on this one. Uh, to, to address this particular concern, um, you know, over under procurement and setting up the resources correctly, is, is a middle ground here, rather than pro uncertainty based on forecast, um, to stay with the nodal approach, but you know, prorate the uncertainty um, nodally so that it addresses the example in Bakersfield and wherever it was in the West Coast there, but then still distribute it to the nodes. So it's somewhere in between. Would that not address this concern? So you've got a kind of hybrid approach here? Because then, then there shouldn't be an argument of procurement, oh, um, you know, with tolerance there is with, with, with the four, and, and the, the resources should get set up for it. This is, this is Carrie again. Um, yeah, so WPTF's position is that this should be addressed regardless of whether we stay with nodal or whether we move to zonal. So um, I, I don't know if I would call it a middle ground, but I would say, yes, if we stay with nodal, it certainly would be addressed and it would better resolve our issue. Yeah, so, so move away from proration and forecast and prorate based on zones that better reflect uncertainty, but still stick with the nodal. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we think there are other reasons to consider zonal, but we believe at a minimum, the change you suggested should be done. Yeah, thanks. Okay, got it, okay. Yeah, and I think the biggest difference is that location, the, the variation you get in uncertainty based on location um, is in the current yeah. approach ignored. Yeah, one thing I would, I would point out though is even, even the likes of a Bakersfield in the shoulder months, you see a lot of uncertainty on the shoulder months with solar and, and that shouldn't be ignored. But I, I, get, I, I get the distinction you're trying to make between in this example, coastal versus, um, you know, a central location during the summer. Yeah, where there may be some cloud or whatever in the morning. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Okay, we have one more question over the phone from J.K. Wang. Well, this is hi, Kara. This this is J.K. and Kelly. This is J.K. Wang from PGA. You can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Hi, thank you, first of all, for sharing the, the thoughts. It's very interesting. I, I have a couple more uh, technical-wise questions, and hopefully it will not um, bore anyone. So uh, when you see the active zones, um, I guess my question is, I assume that implies we will not use the ancillary service zones, right? So we'll be defining new zones for the distribution of these uncertainties, am I right? Yeah, we just use uh, active zones um, because depending on the zonal framework, you can come up with zones in different ways. Um, so it, it wasn't meant to mean anything specific. Um, they may or may not align with the AS zones. I think it depends on how you do how you define the zones and what you look at. Okay, that's really helpful. I'm asking, I guess, is because I assume that when you're able to distribute like more requirements to the active zones that you think will have more uncertainty realized, then these zones will naturally have more uncertainties, but it's not necessarily aligned with the existing and serious service zones. So if that's the case, like uh, to your specific examples, then how granular will those zones be? And yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think that's one that Scott, yeah, Scott Harvey might have some ideas. Uh, is that meeting this Friday? I think the MSC meeting is this Friday. Um, but no, that's a great question. And I think it's going to, you know, um, require some studies and some evaluations and figure out the best approach and kind of that what is that balance in terms of how granular you go with the zones. And then, you know, follow up on that, you know, how. 
how dynamic will this song be? Because the uncertainties may, you know, change from time to time. So I guess if, you know, the, it turns out to be the zones can be fairly granular and even dynamic over time. Would you think that will be a challenging, even like more than a nodal to be implemented because that will definitely increase the complexity of implementation as well? Yeah, that point came up yesterday in conversation. Um, and I think kind of where it went is we, you know, yes, I think if you allow on the fly real time definitions of zones that's going to get very uh, complex very quickly um, but you know these could be as static as not saying they're the exact same but as static as the as zones and the kaiso for example has 10 regions defined and they can choose which regions to enforce based on what seasonal trends they're expecting um, so you can take something along that line along that line as well um, but I think that's a conversation that needs to be had. Um, I think the more uh, dynamic you get, yes, it's going to add processing time. And I don't think the Kaiso is going to appreciate the added complexity with that. But they don't right. have to be like completely static either. Right. So yeah, you say basically my point is we're hitting like two different extremes, right? Either we have like st static big zones that can you know, simplify the calculation, but we kind of ignore the internal congestions and that may cause some indeliverabilities within those big zones. We, we can have nodal, but then the forecast the accuracy or inaccuracy will really bothers you know, how effective the deliverability will be. Now in the middle, you have those zones and you have um, maybe change dynamically and they make things more complicated so um, I guess the thing is, let me ask you this. If we actually have this zonal requirements put on top of the nodal um, uh, requirements, let's say, you know, because we have BAA on top of the, um, the nodal requirements, right? You have first the BAA requirements and distributed to nodal. Do you think it will also work if we have another layer of the zonal requirements but preserve the nodal requirements as well. So are you thinking maybe coming up with a more granular way to forecast the uncertainty before you distribute it down to the nodal? No, what I'm saying is basically like, for example, you have a requirement for Kaiso BAA, and then you can distribute it, for example, to three different zones, right? You have 100% um, um, to distribute it to, to zone A and 110, 110% to zone B. And then for a more static zone, we have maybe like only 90 or 60% of distribution, depends on how you do the calculation. But then on the bottom, you still have the nodal requirements. You still have those constraints model. Do you think that will work? Uh, that's but, but then the, on the nodal, of course, it will be distributed in a different way. It will yeah. be on, on a zonal level. You know, okay. you use the zone to distribute it. That's definitely an interesting idea. We have to think about it some more. It sounds like it's adding another level to the distribution uncertainty methodology, um, but interesting concept. We'll think about that one. Okay, thank you for sharing the thoughts. Really, really appreciate it. Oh, oh, hey, Steve. Steve Keen from Edison. One of the things that I've been thinking about with the uncertainty is that there seem to be kind of two elements to it. One of it is tracking the the changes that occur within the intra hour adjustments that have to be made the fact that we're in the day ahead market we're solving for a you know an hourly value but then when you get to real time you actually you know the the level is changing significantly across that hour so there's that type of uncertainty which i think would be reasonably forecast you know you can make a good effort estimate of what that is. And then there's kind of the other uncertainty. And I think maybe splitting um, the imbalance into those two pieces might be might be useful, both in terms of how you allocate it out to the various um, causes or to various elements. So whether it's VERS or uh, load, you know, if you think about it happening, if you think about something in the afternoon, if you're talking about like, you know, three o'clock or four o'clock, you're probably not going to see a whole lot of that ramping in the in solar, for example, but if you're talking about the six o'clock hour 
in September, you know, the five or the six o'clock hour, there's an awful lot of that ramping that's probably going to be due to the, the solar ramping down. And I, you know, I, I just think looking at, at that might be helpful in terms of how we allocate the costs out and allocate it to the various zones and things, but, but also potential how we, how we address it. Um, you know, like this was getting back to Jeff's concept that he talked about yesterday of phantom congestion and not wanting to do too much. There may be a certain part of that that is, you know, readily predictable. It's this the, the ramp piece that we would expect to happen every day. So maybe you you account for that, and then the other, the, the kind of the more unpredictable stuff that you know you you don't necessarily reserve transmission. If we're going to do that kind of adjustment, maybe something like that. Yeah, that's definitely an interesting idea. I think that really, you know, one of the big picture questions I always have when we start talking about these trade offs is, you know. How much do we actually want to hedge in a day ahead time frame, and how well do we think the day ahead market and the deployment scenarios are a good proxy for what's going to materialize in real time? I think the conversation yesterday really highlighted. Well, essentially, we're expecting 95% of uncertainty to materialize. Are we comfortable with that? Do we think that's actually going to happen all the time? I don't think so. Um, I don't think it's going to happen hardly at all in real time. But are, do, is that what really what we want to hedge for in the day ahead? Um, but those are some interesting thoughts for sure. This is James Friedrich from the CAI. So I just want to add that early in the stakeholder process, maybe in the straw proposal, perhaps in an appendix, we did um, look at that break, exact breakdown to look at how the imbalances um, compare between sort of hour to hour uncertainty and then within our variation. Um, and it's sort of as you expect during the ramping periods, a lot of the imbalances because of the intra hour ramp needed. And then a lot of the actual uncertainty comes in the middle of the day during the solar period for the CAISO. Um, so I can help dig up that if that's helpful to, to take a look. And then we have a question in the chat for George, actually. So the question's from Jeff Nelson. And it's uh, basically in the deployment scenarios, is the delta gen, gen and load required to use the IRP exclusively? I'm not sure I understand the question fully. Um, are we talking about how exactly we distribute the uncertainty between load and ver nodes? Jeff, do you want to enter the verbal queue? Yeah. Okay, so we'll come back to that, Jeff, um, later today. But we're going to move forward. Okay, um, so again, the whole point of these conversation is let's figure out what the trade-offs are. So from a zonal and nodal framework in terms of what is the risk of real-time deliverability, because if we think about it, that's what we're really trying to get at. Um, how can we procure capacity in the day ahead timeframe to give us enough assurance that when real-time conditions actually happen, where we procured that capacity can help meet the needs. Um, so we're calling it real-time deliverability risk. And between the two approaches, um, we don't see too much difference in that risk, and, but for different reasons, right? So the nodal approach, we kind of walked this um, in some detail, so I won't belabor it too much more. But the nodal approach, it's really because of the way that we're distributing that uncertainty requirement in the deployment scenarios. We could get the situation where we're over procuring in some areas like the Bakersfield area, but in reality, we need that capacity to reach the Bay Area. And if there's any binding, if there's any transmission constraints between those two areas, well now under a nodal approach, we've procured capacity that is no longer deliverable in real time. Under a zonal approach, we're not saying that that's not gonna happen. We're saying, yes, it's, it's a bigger bubble that you might not have all the transmission constraints modeled. Um, so in that scenario, the risk is, well, if we kind of ignore some of the internal transmission constraints, what's the likelihood of one of those constraints binding in the real-time market and now in the same situation we have capacity we procured and in real time it can't be deliverable so when it comes to real-time deliverability risk we don't see much difference the nodal has the same risk as the zonal approach 
Um, but really the difference, and we'll get into the next slide, um, the difference comes in when we're talking about price formation. I believe that's the next slide. Okay, so what is the impact on price? So again, if we go back to that spectrum and we're moving between a nodal framework down to or up to a zonal framework, we're going to get different price granularities, right? The nodal framework has specific prices at each nodal location. A zonal framework is gonna probably have similar to AS, one price per zone. And the nodal framework is gonna break that price signal into a SMEC-like for the IR capacity and a congestion cost. Um, and I have two, three cost components, George. Is, are we doing losses? And I don't think we're doing losses in the IRU price, but I wanted to confirm. Yeah, we decided not to um, model the loss deviation, so marginal losses, the, the actual losses that are because of the deployment, uh, we do account for those, but not the marginal losses. So when we linearize the constraints, we don't assume that there is an additional loss because of the delta deployment from the previous solution of the power flow. Okay, so the IRU nodal prices will have two components, not three. Yes. Perfect, okay, thank you. That was my understanding, but wanted to confirm. Um, so you can kind of see the spectrum in terms of price granularity as you go from a nodal to a system-wide price. Obviously system-wide is just one price for the entire footprint. Um, zonal, you can kind of envision somewhere in between depending on how you define the regions. Next slide, please. Okay, so the nodal imbalance reserve prices. Um, I think it's really important that we keep in mind that price signals mean something. Um, we have, if we have to make sure that they actually are accurate, they're reflecting the system needs. Um, I know sometimes it might be correct mathematically. Um, when you put a bunch of formulas together in optimization, the prices come out, they're correct from a mathematical standpoint but that doesn't mean that it makes sense from an economic, economic standpoint. And that's what we really need to think through in these, under these two approaches. Um, again, the more nodal the design, the more granular the prices are, you're gonna have. Um, and I think those nodal prices, if they are accurate and they provide meaningfully economic signals, um, then the added transparency that you get from going nodal is beneficial. Um, so we have to ask ourselves that. But if they don't provide that, meaningfully economic signal and you look at those prices and you're using those prices to make investment decisions, well, now there's all sorts of other market implications that um, kind of filter down because of that inaccurate price signal. Next slide, please. Okay, so I know Jeff kind of touched on this a little bit yesterday. We have some examples that we wanted to walk through to kind of show under what conditions we think that those price signals under a nodal framework are again, they're mathematically correct, don't get me wrong, but they're sending the wrong signal. Um, so in this scenario, we have load and a wind resource on one side of the constraint, a traditional generator on the other side of the constraint. We have upward uncertainty allocated to both uh, the load and the wind resource. Now under the base case, um, again, that's assume that the up upward uncertainty is not materializing under the base case, it's just, can that generator meet the load, um, the load at that location or meet the demand at that load location. You're gonna have a 70 megawatt net flow along that transmission line, assuming it's 100 megawatts. You're not gonna have any congestion in the base case. But now we're going to the deployment scenarios. Now it's saying we need an extra 30 megawatts of capacity that can flow from that generator across that transmission line to meet the load and wind upward uncertainty. So that's gonna come, that's gonna bind that transmission constraint in the deployment case. Now you have congestion. So how is this gonna filter down into the prices that we're seeing? Well, one, it's gonna cause the energy prices to separate. You're gonna have higher energy prices at the load and wind locations than you do at the generator because the congestion is going in that direction. And two, you're gonna have higher IRU prices at the wind and load location. Again, for the same reason, um, you're having that congestion go from the generator resource down to the load and wind location. So you see price separation the day ahead price signal saying, hey, the energy is valued higher at this load and wind location than it is at this generator on the other side. Next slide, please. Now let's go into real time. Now, if in real time, the uncertainty actually does materialize, then the generator resource 
will be dispatched 100 megawatts. In the prior slide, it was awarded 70 megawatts of energy and 30 IRU. And we're saying all of that uncertainty actually materialized. Then you're gonna end up with real-time prices that reflect the same signals in the day ahead. And they're gonna be consistent. And I think in that case, they provide a meaningfully economic signal. You have day ahead prices that are actually reflecting what materializes in real time. But that's a big assumption. We are saying that the only time that price can provide a meaningfully economic signal is if 95% of uncertainty materializes. That's not gonna happen that often. I forget who did the math yesterday, but it was like 1.25% of the time. Um, so if you go to the next slide, Okay, so then if take the same day ahead setup, but now in real time, that uncertainty does not materialize, which I think this is gonna be most of the time, this is the scenario we're talking about. Now you're having inconsistent pricing signals between the day ahead and real time. Now you don't have any congestion over that transmission line. The prices are the same and the price at the load and wind location is now lower than what it was in day ahead. So you're creating this systematic price divergence between day ahead and real time when those deployment scenarios are unrealistic. So if you go to the next slide, and this is, I believe, where Jeff Nelson was going yesterday. So what is that gonna do? Well, virtual bidders in our market are very sophisticated. They're gonna see that price divergence, they're gonna come in and they're going to start offering uh, virtual supply when they're seeing a high day ahead price compared to real time because those deployment scenarios are causing congestion in the day ahead market that's not materializing in real time. So yes, they're gonna start to converge the price and we might say, great, that's a benefit to the market. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing, but they're going to cause a cost to the market for actually no benefit. So in this situation, having virtuals solve a problem or address an issue that's being caused by the deployment scenarios is not an efficient market outcome. Um, and we wanna make a slight distinction because virtuals, we do believe offer a, you know, a benefit to the market um, when they come in and they offer virtual supply to fill in under scheduled supply or under scheduled VERS or um, you know, lower demand, that does provide a benefit to the market because they're filling in supply and demand that is going to show up in real time. Whereas in this situation, they're literally just taking advantage of the fact that our deployment scenarios are reflecting congestion in the day ahead that's not actually gonna materialize. Next slide, please. And then this is actually, I think the, the main point Jeff was getting on yesterday is so now you have virtuals coming in. Um, what happens if a virtual supply comes in and creates counterflow on a transmission line in the day ahead market that allows more upward uncertainty to clear. So, but for that virtual offer, that uncertainty wouldn't have been awarded to a specific resource because it, it would have been behind, it would have been behind a transmission constraint. So that virtual comes in and creates that counter flow on that transmission line. And now we have a resource that can be provided or awarded more IRU. Well, when we go into real time, and that uncertainty doesn't materialize, and that virtual is now gone, or sorry, that, must, that uncertainty does materialize, we need some of that IRU from that resource, but the virtuals are gone. That counterflow is gone. Now we're stuck in a situation where we've awarded upward uncertainty or downward uncertainty to a resource that is now stranded. So it's not stranded because we didn't look at the deployment scenarios. It's not stranded because we didn't model transmission constraints. It's stranded because our deployment scenarios were unrealistic, caused a price divergence that virtuals came in to react to, and now has put us in a different situation. So in all of these scenarios, we get into real time under a nodal approach with inefficient procurement and stranded capacity. Next slide, please. Okay, I won't spend much. I'm gonna hit this just at a very, very high level. Again, going back to the importance of a price signal, the nodal approach, the main difference you get is you get that congestion cost signal, right? That is what is creating the difference between the prices across the entire system is that congestion cost. So what's the importance of the congestion component today in energy prices? It's used for transmission investments. It's used for figuring out the best place to site storage or generation. 
um, it is used to make investment decisions. So if you are sending a signal that's inaccurate in the day ahead timeframe that's used for this investment decision at a more global level, you're going to get inefficient business decisions being made that are down the road are gonna affect our market because you're gonna get transmission built in the wrong areas. You're gonna get resources cited in the wrong areas. Next slide, please. Okay, just for the sake of time, I'll go ahead and skip this. I think I, I hit that point pretty hard already. Okay, so under a zonal framework, yes, you're gonna lose that visibility. You're gonna lose that, that sense of granularity, but maybe that's not a bad thing if the value or the benefit of that granular price isn't meaningful. Um, so under a zonal framework, you could have different prices depending on how you define the zones and the value, the marginal value of that upward or downward uncertainty within that zone. Um, so it's not like we're not gonna see one price across the entire footprint. You could still get some price divergence. Um, and in a way that kind of indirectly reflects uh, deliverability or um, differences in uncertainty across the system. Next slide, please. Okay, so I think um, just to kind of round it out, the, the trade-offs between a zonal and a nodal price, uh, price formulation. Um, again, I think under the nodal design, that granularity that you do get is beneficial if those congestion components are meaningful. Um, and I think the only way in the situation that they are, they do provide an accurate signal is if the 95% uncertainty that we are using the deployment scenarios actually materialize in real time and materialize where we expected them to. Um, and again, those are two very, very big assumptions. But obviously under zonal, you lose that granularity, but if you're not benefiting from that granularity in the first place, then the question is, What's the, you know, what's the purpose it's providing? Um, so this is switching topics quickly. Do we wanna see if there's any questions? And can we do a time check too? So about 25 more minutes. Um, can you, okay. And we have a question over the phone from Seth Cochran. So let's go ahead and unmute Seth. Thank you. Um, Seth with DC Energy. I, I agree with all the comments that have been made that uh, the market shouldn't be set up so that there's these um, divergences that create opportunities for virtuals. But I do want to clarify something I heard yesterday um, about the role of virtuals. And I think I think one thing to to understand is is that if the if we set up the market design such that these inefficiencies were there, uh, if the virtuals weren't there too, then the market would remain in a more inefficient state than it would be with the virtuals there. So it's really uh, the virtual activity would actually help it help transcend the market from this less efficient state to a more efficient state, but. I do agree that uh, we just really shouldn't go down that path to begin with, so. Seth. Before we move on, to, so we're about to go to a different topic, ancillary services. Um, I'll, I'll just note, you know, some of um, our examples, we know that, you know, uncertainty will materialize according to predictions, you know, some of the time, much of the time. The question is how much? Um, I think this is why uh, Jeff from SCE asked for some, I forget the word he used, but for some screening or for you know some um, additional testing by the CAISO in advance to actually provide more information on this. Um, so a lot of this is illustrative, but we're using these kind of broad, large illustrative scenarios because if they happen even on a small scale across the entire footprint, we are going to see significant inefficiencies. Um, and we've also seen when we have um, 
you know, uh, hot boxes or, or price dumps for virtuals or financial uh, market participants, people tend to panic at the CAISO. So we also don't want to set ourselves up for an issue where virtuals, like Seth was saying, you know, 95% of the time are helpful. And then 5% of the time, you know, they're not converging, they're actually making the situation a little bit worse. And that's a reason to say, oh, no, you know, virtuals are bad. So I just want to make it really clear, you know, that yeah, we're, we're providing these kind of extreme examples for illustrative purposes, um, but we don't think they'll materialize all the time. It's just a matter of how often and considering the trade-off between nodal and zonal. Uh, let's go to Stuart Kelly. Thank you. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't necessarily disagree with the, the comments are getting made, and I understand you know how, how they're getting portrayed in this um, presentation. I, I, I mean, this is all about trade-offs, and I, I take a little bit issue with the investment statement. I think that's absolutely, um, and Edam about the investment signals in the short term. I'm more worried about 0.25%. So I may be the only one that's really worried about the 1.25%. And I don't think we talk enough about it. I think it's fair to say that, you know, there's issues with zonal or, or, and nodal. But at the moment, I lean towards nodal because it's slightly better recognizing all the issues that have been raised. And I think the one thing, the common theme from WPTF and from you know, presentation yesterday is is this call for you know data and simulation. Um, I, I think it's I think the the question ultimately uh, coming out of this stakeholder process is you know where do we start and and what are the trade offs and and I think you know having the matrix that WPTF has put forward uh, you know maybe with some out, um, input you know broader input may help us arrive at what is the right trade-offs and, and where do we start? But I think we would all agree um, that we need some you know, further analysis simulation is, is probably better to start now in planning for, for those different scenarios. I, I think you know, Jeff raised some really interesting points yesterday and I'd love to see that data. I don't know how often the, the, you know, that 1.25% will happen, but I'm really interested when it does. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, this is James from the CAISO. I just want to make a workshop facilitation announcement that I'm happy to yield some of my presentation time, but I do have a few questions. So if you'd leave me a couple of minutes before you wrap up to ask questions. Yeah, of course. And I will, I, we have a few slides left and I will try and get through these quickly. Um, so the next topic we're kind of pivoting a little bit here is talking about the AS service or ancillary services. Um, you know, ancillary services are a WEC and NERC requirement, they are used to help protect the system from grid reliability issues for operating reserves. And then you use a regulation every four seconds to manage um, the area control or the area control area or ACE. Um, so we have to keep that in mind. And AS today is procured zonally. It has been from since the startup of MRTU. Um, so if ancillary services being procured zonally is actually resulting in a lot of that capacity being stranded behind transmission constraints, then that's a big deal. It's, it's reliability risk. Um, so we should be talking about that um, if that is actually happening. And we can use how frequently that's happening to kind of proxy, give a proxy for, okay, if we do go down a zonal framework, how much are we actually gonna see that issue happen with IRU capacity? Um, now, we did a little bit of digging, and it looks like the CAISO actually has a report they issue every three years um, that shows stranded AS and how often is it happening, how often are operators actually having to block that capacity. And the latest report, uh, you know, it ends in 2019, and I think the CAISO has to issue this report again this year. Um, so hopefully we have some updated data soon on this. But the latest report shows, honestly, it doesn't happen that often. Um, it's actually very rarely used. Operators at least based on this report, things might have changed since 2019. Um, they have a tool that can help them identify when this is going to happen and they can uh, block the resources, but they don't use it that much. And they also have the ability to enforce new zones um, when they do see certain transmission constrained areas coming. 
Next slide, please. Okay, so what does that mean for IRU? Well, if you take a zonal AS product, which again is a reliability product that is mandated, and you combine that with a nodal IR in the same market, they are co-optimized together. They are going to be competing for the same capacity that's offered into the day ahead market. What that's going to end up doing is it's going to actually have the market prioritize awarding imbalance reserves to resources that it sees not behind a constraint, which is one of the goals of this policy. But for AS, that means it's going to force AS to be procured more than it is today behind a transmission constraint. So in a way, it is prioritizing the deliverability of an imbalance reserve product over a, um, the AS product, a reliability product. And we don't think that is an ideal outcome. Um, yesterday, there were some conversations. Actually, if you want to go to the next slide real quick. I think. Um, yeah, so yesterday, there were some conversations that um, the Kaiso did acknowledge that, yes, this can happen. If you combine a zonal, um, a zonal AS with a nodal IR, uh, they acknowledge that all else equal, you're going to probably increase the amount of AS that is stranded in real time. Um, so when a reliability condition actually happens, operators are now scrambling. They don't have that capacity that they, that they thought they had available, um, or they have to do more blocking of AS. Um, so there was a statement yesterday that the Kaisa thought that was a good reason to actually move forward with a nodal IR product. Um, we strongly disagree with that. I think if stranded AS is an issue, we should be prioritizing that conversation over nodal IR at a minimum, those conversations should be happening together. Um, but that does not mean that we should move forward with a nodal IR product that then risks re AS reliability. Um, and yes, it is in the catalog um, and we appreciate it being in the catalog. But again, just because it's in the catalog doesn't mean it's on a roadmap anytime soon. So it seems like it keeps, you know, this has popped up years ago um, and it keeps kind of getting kicked down the road. So um, we don't know at this point when it will actually be discussed, but we think that should be prioritized or at least discussed together with the nodal IR. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, this is James from the Kaiso. I just want to be clear that um, yesterday's presentation would we did not say we think this is a good reason to support nodal and balance reserves. We said that we think that this we we agree that this may be an issue, but that this statement is a better um, statement in support of nodal AS than it is against nodal and balance reserves, and not necessarily to say that this is this statement means it's supporting nodal and balance reserves. I just want to make that distinction. Okay, I yeah. appreciate that conversation. Yes, yeah. Oh, sorry, I flipped my word, sorry. <laughs> the, the, the big point is, yeah, we need to be having those conversations together. If we're gonna go nodal one product, we should go nodal both at the same time, not one in front of the other. And if you do one in front of the other, it should be the AS in front of the IR, just given that it's a reliability product. Sorry, I threw these slides together last night in response to the conversation yesterday. There is a question on the phone if you want to take that one. Yeah, go for it. Unmute. Oh, can I get through one more and then we'll take it? This just kind of provides, um, yes, yeah, so the next slide real quick. Okay, there it is. Um, so th this is just a table that's pulled out of that report that I think we linked to in the slide um, that, that shows AS scarcity events. Um, and you can see that red box row right there, that's the issues, transmission issues that resulted in the operators actually blocking ancillary services. This is frequency, 34 times in 2019. Oh, scare, oh when, it, when it causes a scarcity event. So 34 times in 2019. And I don't like to do math on the fly, but if these are five minute intervals or 15 minute intervals, because that's when scarcity happens, uh, that's a lot, that's, I'm gonna guess less than 1% of the time, close to zero. Okay, I'll take the question. All right, let's unmute Petter. Are you ready for the phone question? Yes, can we unmute Petter, please? 
Uh, thank you. This is Peter from SGM. Uh, I think if location of can be implemented, which means within available time frame of market clearing, with available information, with limitation of technology, with expected accuracy, and other things that may be conditions for acceptable design, it is more accurate and better than Zona. No doubt about that. So from that point of view, I think WPTF correctly in one of the previous meetings listed potential issues with location. With many of them, if not solvable, can be showstoppers. And I was always expecting that we'll go through that list and give guys a chance to address that to see is really any showstopper or it is possible to implement. Instead of that, we are immediately assuming that that methodology has deficiencies and we are uh, kind of proposing a zonal approach with very, very detailed, smart discussions, a lot of good stuff. Before even, uh, you know, making sure that what Kaiser is proposing is not doable. And I would like to give you one example. Based on what I heard yesterday from George, it looks like that Kaiso is taking, uh, taking correct approach in how to model constraints in Nodal. What that means? That means that they are not going to enforce IR deformance scenarios in transmission contingency cases. That will dramatically reduce the complexity and size of the problem. He also said that they are not going to enforce nomograms which may look like N minus two uh, contingencies, which would be another magnitude or two magnitudes the less additional constraints for the problem. With all these changes, they completely mitigate the risk of performance issues with this approach, completely. Because the potential increase of binding transmission constraints, which are main concern for performance, is going to be negligible compared to what already they have in the system. In addition to that, if they take the same approach to contingency reserves, they can implement contingency reserves the same way like they implement IR product without significant impact of performance. So what Greg said yesterday is correct, going this direction will open the door for that implementation. Now, if you take this one item from the issues list that WPTF prepared, we can say, okay, check mark. That's not the issue anymore. Let's go to the next one before we start inventing completely, you know, different approach. And you can go one by one. You can go like what Jeff did yesterday is moving in that direction. He said, okay, if you move this from IFM to, to RAC, you'll probably avoid this issue about uh, prices, about counter flow by virtuals, mixing physical with, uh, with the virtual and so on and so forth. Probably address also issue with mitigation. By just m making that one step, you can see how that addresses some of the potential issues. There was a lot of discussion in these slides, and I said that yesterday, that nodal kind of calculation, kind of calculation, nodal distribution, I'm sorry, I don't want to upset offend George, may be less accurate than Zona. And that is the case if Kaiso continues doing nodal distribution like in the past, like they take uh, balancing area load, they take uh, uh, parameterization for state estimator, they calculate load distribution factor, and this is good down. That methodology worked when systems did not have much non-conforming load on load nodes where Kaiso is modeling. With solar, wind, and batteries, there is a lot of non-conforming load in addition to conforming load in different nodes. Now, for some of those non-conforming load, let's say, strong solar or strong wind farms, maybe bottom-up forecasting is better. And they have to do it anyway, because we are talking about IR about P50. And P50, if P50 is wrong, up or down, then IR is wrong more than 5%. So they have to do that accuracy anyway, independent of this initiative. So as a conclusion, my suggestion is that we really focus on 
analyzing is kind of proposal doable and feasible and try to improve it before we gave up on that and start talking about the zona where there is a lot of energy kind of spent in discussion. And I'm sitting and listening to that. I'm not, I cannot focus on that because I'm not convinced that the other one is, is not feasible. So that's my feedback. Thank you. lot to digest, but I, I get your concluding point, um, and I think that's kind of why we want to have those trade-off discussions sooner rather than later. Um, and I think it's through those trade-off discussions that, yeah, we can think about what changes can we make to the nodal framework that might address some of the issues and maybe not go fully system level, but it, again, it's, it's somewhere along that spectrum between a system or a zonal framework and fully nodal. Um, I know I'm out of time, and actually, so I will skip the last few slides I have on just some additional considerations. I think complexity was one of them. And I, you know, that just came up in terms of computational time. I think there are some trade-offs there that we can talk about. Um, but just if you jump to the very last slide, I, slide 45. It's, <laughs> it takes a while. Okay, here we go. So this is the end goal, right, of these workshops is let's come up with a table um, that has every market design element listed. This is just a, a sample. Um, these are not all the market design elements that um, Nodal or, or Zonal has. And then let's start thinking through them. Let's compare them side by side. Let's identify the trade-offs. And then let's think about the trade-offs because one of the trade-offs might be something we're worth living with and we want to live with it um, so that we can have something else. But I think it is gathering all these conversations that we've had over the last two weeks on this topic, putting them into a digestible way that we can easily start having those trade-off discussions and going through this kind of one by one um, and start wrapping our minds around it so we can hopefully clearly figure out what, what the path forward looks like. And I'll, I'll just add to that. I think there's also an iterative loop here because as we've even been talking about these trade-offs, we've heard from Petter and Studer and JK and they've said, hey, how can we improve the nodal framework to address you know, the issue you're pointing out? And so um, I think that works in both directions. Maybe we say, oh, this is too big of a trade-off. Can we improve nodal? Oh, this is too big of a trade-off. Can we improve zonal? And so there are different ways to improve either framework. And it'll just come down to, you know, after you do that iterative of approach, where do we land as stakeholders? Um, you know, also we have to think about where do we want to start and where do we want to end? Do we want to do fully complex? Do we want to start simple? Um, what is the best place to begin um, when you start implementation? And so I think um, no matter what, we'll end up in a better place. And I definitely don't want anyone to take it as WPTF is supporting zonal. We are supporting the evaluation of zonal because we think it's worthwhile as a concept in and of itself. But also we think it will help articulate many issues that we've been pointing out about the nodal for a couple of years now. Um, so whether this helps, you know, perhaps further understanding or gets us to a different place, I, you know, in terms of the framework, I think WPTF is fine either way. Um, and then finally, Petter, I just wanted to respond a little bit to your point. You know, we're market people here at WPTF. Um, so how we'll do the trade-offs will be, yes, processing time and complexity, but also is it sending the right market signals? Um, is it sending the right market signals internal to the CAISO and then across the EDAM and then across the different financial products? So that'll be the lens in which we make our trade-offs, but different stakeholders will have different lenses. You know, the Kaiso technology team and George, you'll want it to solve, right? And you probably will have a more engineering bent. Um, people who participate in virtual markets will probably have a completely different perspective. And so I just wanna, you know, say that we, again, don't have a, a predetermined path we wanna take, but we really are appreciative of these conversations and, and think that they should continue um, and again, really appreciate the quick pace we're going on as well. Thanks. This is James Friedrich from the CAISO. And I, I wanted to yield some of my presentation time because yours is a lot more interesting and, and uh, informative. And um, I thought I would use some of the time just to, I have some discussion items that maybe we can talk about. Um, and I think I only need 45 minutes for mine, um, if that's okay. So um, I wanted to ask on a couple points and I'll try, try to focus on the most um, interesting ones, I think. Um, back in slide six, 
Oh, this is way back. Um, you don't have to go to the slide, but we can think, this is the downward need for downward product slide. <laughs> it dawns on me that, you know, the, the, the presentation uses lack of scarcity events for downward needs as a proxy for operational needs. And I'm not sure that that's the most appropriate way to think about it. Um, the operational need to me means that can the market and the incentives provided by the market situate the system differently to operate it more efficiently. Um, and that may not, that those can, that can occur in situations that are not preventing uh, scarcity events. And so I get that, you know, the CAISO BA may have a, a, a surplus of downward dispatch capability from renewables, but is it possible that, you know, if we're relying uh, heavily on renewables to provide us the downward dispatch capability because they're, they're economically bidding, and in situations where you actually have to economically dispatch them, sinking the real-time price because they probably are offering energy at zero dollars or less, is there an opportunity where you can incentivize different types of resources like gas or hydro imports, batteries, uh, to provide downward dispatch capability that can sort of um, cut off the need to use renewables for that downward dispatch capability? And if they're not already sort of bidding in such a way, our incentives needed perhaps to enable that. And so, but I will concur that we, we have more thinking to do and demonstration to do that. If that's an issue, we should uh, be providing some information if that operational needs real. So we're, um, you know, looking into that data, but I just wanted to see if you had any comments on that. Yeah. I mean, I think it's important to, I don't, I don't, know what you mean about using scarcity as a proxy. Um, what we were just pointing out is that there was um, sufficient economic bids, even in periods of um, high renewable uh, production um, that exceeded load, that they cut into the economic offers and not into the self schedules, which is just showing that you have plenty of economic offers, basically, because by the time you've gone to renewables, you've cut every other resource that's not self scheduling. Um, but to think, you know, downward disability downward dispatchability is simply an economic offer from a resource that's online. Um, and it's my understanding that we don't have very many resources continuing to self-schedule um, and that much of the, the kind of self-schedule PMIN energy that is in the real-time market is a function of the RUC bias, where instead of, you know, perhaps in the IFM, you know, committing one unit, you end up committing two units in RUC. And now you have that non-dispatchable payment energy in real time. But it really is an empirical question. And it's one that I think if the CAISO presented on, here's the payment energy in real time, here's how we expect it to change if we move this in market, um, here's who self-schedules, who economically offers, you could justify this, or maybe your data would show you can't. But it all has to do with you know, um, non-dispatchable payment energy, economic offers, and self-schedules. Thanks for that. Yeah, so um, I'm gonna move topics. So I appreciate that response. Um, I wanna, there's, a, there's a, a part in slide 14 that I wanna get into and it gets touched on in other slides, but it's essentially about the, the comment here in the first or second bullet, first sub bullet about um, the verse behind a constraint less like you know that, that sentence. I want to I want to get scratch the word ver and and consider any resource, but I, I struggle with this claim and the reason I, I'm not understanding why there is any relationship between the bids and the deliverability. Um, so resources bid based on cost that doesn't have anything to do with their deliverability and the opportunity cost portion of the price is you know, a, a, a function of the deliverability of the congestion of that resource. So can you help me sort of tie the- Yeah, although I'm together? gonna have to have you repeat the last part of your question because you said resources bid based on costs and there's nothing that will like make me see red more than that statement. Like resources bid based on their willingness to provide a product and it's not based on their costs. Um, I think we already talked about that in, in VERS. Um, but uh, generally, um, you know, the reason why I'm highlighting VERS has to honestly do with studies done in other markets that show 
that when they found the non-deliverability, it was primarily from wind or solar. Maybe that's not true in the CAISO, but it's my understanding that typically it, it is the renewable that's behind the constraint. Um, and this has to do again with the fact that they can't bid an FRP. So if you're behind a constraint, your opportunity cost is zero. So you look cheap. Um, if you do bid, right, the optimization considers the bid price and the opportunity price. So if you bid very high, for example, you would not look cheap and the optimization would not take you. It's not perfect. Um, you know, you could still end up having a ver with or any resource with a, a very high bid and behind be behind a constraint and maybe the optimization would still take that resource. Um, I'm just saying it, the reason why we're putting VERS is because the, the limited data we've seen from the CAISO and then a lot of the data we've seen from other markets show that that non-deliverability really has to do with renewables that are stranded. But again, if you showed me data otherwise, I would change my mind. Yeah. You know, I say cost, you say willingness to provide. I'm not sure. I, I, we probably mean the same thing, but all I'm, all I'm trying to say is they, they have some sort of willingness to pay. And it sort of gets back into, you know, yesterday we, you know, we said we have this AS buyback issue where generators who are available are bidding for contingency reserves and getting awards. And the reason why we're not punishing them in real time for their undeliverability when we buy them back is because you know, it's not their fault that they're undeliverable. They're providing the capacity and it's the market's job to decide where those resources get, you know, awarded. And so that, that sort of drives me in thinking about this as well. If I have some sort of willingness to pay, um, you know, how is that related to my, you know, or my willingness to provide, I guess, better term. Um, how is that related to my situation in terms of my deliverability, which is related to my opportunity cost portion of the price. Well, hopefully I answered that first question on why FRP is taking it, but on um, on the second, what was the second point he made? Do you want to take that one? It's trying, to, it's trying to, to tie in that our claim yesterday that the biddable portion of imbalance reserves is irrelevant to the concern that you could have resources stuck behind constraints. And I, I get that the biddable portion of it means you'll see fewer non-zero prices, but that's not the point. No, it's not to prevent non-zero prices, it's to prevent inaccurate prices. And so just because you have a price doesn't mean it's the right price necessarily, but that's, that's kind of what I'm trying to connect here. Hmm. I'm wondering if we're not being clear at the point on the slide, uh, this is just saying that the reason why in real time you end up procuring um, high price or renewable resources um, or and sorry or resources behind a constraint is because it uses an opportunity cost methodology so they, they're at zero. If, if they're not at zero, they're going to be less likely to be, be procured, especially if they're bidding high for IRP. So I'm just saying, because you bid, this is a less likely scenario to occur in day ahead. And, and I'm, I'm just wondering if that's true, because I don't know if there's any relationship between my uh, resources inherent deliverability and its bid. So I see. If, if, oh, I, I see. Yeah, I am, I am not trying to say that um, a resource's willingness to provide will depend on whether they're deliverable or not in real time, I'm just trying to make the point that naturally in our system, the resources that are stuck behind the constraint today are likely to bid high. Okay. But yeah, they're not connected. And, oh, and I think you made another point on AS buyback, that that was the other thing that I, I wanted to address. So, um, you know, I think ancillary services are, are not a perfect parallel to IRP in terms of, you know, the buyback and why we do that because AS is not re-optimized in real time. Um, and this is an artifact to my understanding because the operators wanted to have certainty on the resources um, that they were procuring and they wanted to know which resources, exact resources. But really, if you were thinking about it from a, you know, an economic perspective, you would wanna re-optimize AS in real time um, and that would free up more resources to be deliverable in real time because of all the different changes between day ahead and real time. So a part of the artifact of the need to block AS is because it is self-scheduled and it's actually more than self-scheduled. It's protected under a high penalty price in real time and no you know, re-optimization is allowed. 
Thank you. Yeah, I was just trying to use that as an example for maybe um, separating the concept of my bid because I'm available and the price at my location because of the congestion. Um, so that's all I was trying to get at. Um, thanks for thanks for um, um, on. There's a couple of times where the term inaccurate or accuracy comes up, and I I I wanted to hone in on that because it seems to me in these pre in these presentations that when the term accurate is used to describe the nodal approach, it's used in comparison to an ideal scenario where the uncertainty at every node is perfectly forecasted, which we know we can't do. But it doesn't say that the accuracy of the Kaiso's nodal approach, although it may not be the ideal nodal forecast, how it relates to the accuracy of the zonal approach, where um, you know the the places with which you distribute or sync the reserves on the system may not be perfectly representative of the uncertainty that materializes, but the zonal approach also doesn't do that. And so maybe the nodal approach, even though it's not a perfect representation of the uncertainty, may be more accurate in terms of where the the awards get distributed relative to the zonal approach. And because um, that means that the awards themselves would be more accurate and the prices would be more accurate, which I know there's discussion about price formation. So I don't know if, I, I don't know if that's more of a comment or a question, but I'll let you respond to that, yeah. So a couple of thoughts there. You're right, zonal might not be perfect either. Um, we're, not, we're not trying to claim that it is. I think it's the trade-off discussion. Um, when we say it's inaccurate distribution, I think it's acknowledged when you when you distribute it based on low distribution factors and solar forecasting, there's clear inaccurate assumptions that go into it. And being able to estimate uncertainty at a nodal level, I, it's extremely complicated. I don't think that's worth going down that path. So given that, and given that if you still know that you are inaccurately distributing the uncertainty in the deployment scenarios, it has these other downstream effects when it comes to price formation. It, that's the trade-off question. Do you want those inaccurate price formations um, and potentially inaccurate procurement of capacity? Again, zonal can still have you know, capacity that's procured that ends up being stranded or behind a constraint. I'm not saying that's flawless either, um, but it is that trade-off discussion. Are you comfortable with the price signals that would come out of a nodal approach? Or do you think maybe estimating uncertainty that might occur in a zone or in a region like in the Bay Area might get you a little bit of a better idea and you have some sort of comfort that any capacity procured in that area would be deliverable in that area. So it, it, it's a balance, it's a balancing act. And, it's, and this conversation hopefully is going to help try and figure out where, where it is appropriate to kind of end up. Thank you. And, um... I do have a compliment. The slide 22 has a beautiful picture of the breakdown of uncertainty, and I was making fun of myself for how ugly my flowchart was, and so I'm jealous of how nice yours looked. Um, so um, well, I was commenting yeah. how it's kind of like a little cartoonish, a, a little but that's what you get when I throw them hey, together. I, I enjoy it, yeah. <laughs> um, I have one last point, and I know a couple of commenters brought this up, and, and JK sort of prompted me to think about this, but I wanna finish my questions off in terms of the zones themselves. So as these discussions have unfolded, I'm, I'm feeling conflicted in understanding what's intended in terms of the formation of the zones. And I see in, in one sense that it would be nice to form zones based on uncertainty where you're looking at zones where maybe the correlation of uncertainty is similar. You know, So you might have like geographic regions where you know, clouds are going to cover every um, all the resources and stuff like that. But is that different than the zones that are constructed by deliverability? And how might you sort of blend them together? I, it makes me wonder if if you have zones set up to capture sort of regional uncertainty that's well correlated. Does that this is that the same as the zones you would set up to maximize deliverability between zones? Yeah, I was just gonna say, I think that's a perfect tee up for the discussion we're gonna have with the MSC on Friday, 
Um, I think there are different ways you could do it. And like anything else, was the word of the day is trade-off, right? Um, I think there are trade-offs. In my mind, you would want to account for both. Like what a fun econ problem, right? You got to account for uncertainty and for transmission. Um, I think that's why we do this, right? So um, I, I think that's how I would create the zones, but um, I know there's lots of different ways to do it. Yeah. Thank you for uh, entertaining my questions and, and compliments on a really nice presentation and well thought out. So really appreciate it. There was one more question on the phone line. Do we have time for it really quick? Okay, Petter, if you just want to keep it brief. I'm, I'm always brief, much briefer than many people on these calls. So Gary, uh, you are wrongly understanding my point that is from engineering point of view, based on my previous work for you know, different place between 95, 2010, I had to become familiar with every uh, market design in the world that was looking for the system at that time. And all those markets had one thing in common. Less accurate you are in modern reality, bigger problem you have, less efficient market, and ultimately less accurate price formation. That's why Kaiser went that way until today, they're trying to make as accurate as possible reality respecting all other market design requirements. And that's why market that they have is so much advanced than any other else. This is another element that I'm glad that they are trying to do that to the maximum technology, because that means more efficient market and better price formation. Thank you. Thanks, Petter. I'm gonna hand it over to James. So um, I don't have nearly as detailed of slides. I, I, I'm going to actually probably skip some of the extension of yesterday's conversation because it was reflected in my questions and, and in the presentation by WPTF. But I, I did have a few things to talk about briefly for, on FRP. So if you can go to the first slide or next slide. So stakeholders have been... Yeah, their stakeholders have been wondering about how the implementation of nodal FRP in our experience relates to the impact of implementation on imbalanced reserves. And we just want to provide a few a few notes on that. Um, you know, first in the in the current FRP deployment, constraints are being gradually included within the deployment scenarios in sort of a phased approach where you can look, you can implement additional constraints, evaluate how they're working, and and keep pile and keep uh, going from there. And ultimately, the ongoing discussions and analysis will inform what the ultimate set of constraints enforced in the FRP deployment scenarios uh, will be, and that will guide us in our implementation of imbalanced reserve. Um, so that's helpful. But in, in many other cases, there, the experience of implementation of nodal FRP um, would require fewer challenges for nodal imbalanced reserve. For example, we can leverage our understanding of how what the impact of the nodal, um, nodal procurement has on the market, on our systems, on our applications. We already have that, that background. Um, there's some new things, new tools that were added as part of the FRP project that we would leverage. Um, for example, there's a new um, tool to cal uh, calculate and host the quantile regression calculation. And actually the quantile regression itself is a new process that um, we had implemented in FRP. And so we've are, already have sort of the scar tissue and, and some of the processes and systems built up through the FRP project that reduce our concern about technical complexity of the implementation relative to the nodal FRP project. Uh, this is Carrie Bentley with um, the Western Power Trading Forum. I was wondering if the uh, mosaic quantile regression was implemented um, with nodal FRP or if it was implemented before that. Go ahead. <laughs> the policy initiative that the stakeholder, the FRP enhancement, that is the nodal procurement, was an independent process that was not related to the new calculation we leverage on the process to bring those at the same time, implementation-wise, they were implemented at the same time. 
Next slide. A few uh, a few stakeholders have been asking, and and I you know we we're sitting here, and ideally it would have been um, nice to have a long suite of data um, where the nodal FRP was implemented for us to be able to share and evaluate before you know consideration of the nodal imbalance reserve. Um, and, and some stakeholders have wondered, you know, well, I, we realized the nodal FRP was implemented on February first, and it may be premature to um, extract any you know, super meaningful, super, anything super meaningful from the data to this point. Um, but what is the CAISO's plan and sort of, and sort of how they plan to share this over time? Um, so um, as, as uh, was shared earlier, the preliminary results of the nodal FRP are expected to be shared um, as soon as next Friday's MPPF meeting. I think it's next Friday. Um, so that's, that's relatively soon um, and that's good. But ultimately, you know, the, uh, the performance of the FRP project will need to be assessed once, you know, all sets of constraints that form the, the final set of constraints enforced in the deployment scenarios are applied in the market, and that will take some time. Um, and ideally, we, you know, you would want to evaluate the performance of FRP stress test under summer conditions and see how those perform. So I would imagine that once you, once you have those things, you're probably looking at a, a more robust reflection on FRP performance around the fall or late summer. Next slide, please. There's also been some, some concern about, you know, there were delays in F FRP and does that signal con issues about the complexity and the, um, of implementation of imbalance reserve. Um, we want to be clear that most of the reason why the FRP project was delayed was related to shifts in the company's priorities, uh, both for the ISO and its vendor to address uh, summer 2021 readiness, readiness items and other critical conditions that propped up last year. Um, and so the, the company decided to uh, defer the deployment of the project um, for another year based on those reasons. And that complexity in terms of the implementation did not contribute much to the schedule delay. That said, there were a couple of things that propped up to be, you know, to be fair, you know, that um, as the project progressed, additional scope of work was added to provide additional transparency. There was development of a new price correction tool that I'm not, um, my understanding was identified was needed relatively later in the process. Um, there was in December, a two month deferral of the project um, to February in which some market testing found that, you know, outlier scenarios were requiring some fixes. Um, and in order to ensure market quality, the project was delayed. Um, so that's just a normal course of business and, and something that the ISO team does that make sure to validate the, the, the new tools they're putting into the market are working properly before they go live in production. And of course, um, part of that two month delay was also holidays were considered and not trying to overload both Kaiso staff and vendor staff during the holidays. Um, this is this is my last slide on on flexible ramping product, its implementation and its relationship to implementation of imbalance reserve. Uh, just I'll pause for any questions or comments. Okay, so in the interest of, oh. Uh, one just popped up over the phone, so let's unmute Stuart Kelly. Hey, James, this, this kind of ties back to the last presentation and um, you know some of the comments Peter made, uh, and maybe uh, you know, in terms of a, a path forward, are, are, we, are we as a group gonna discuss what that path forward looks like today uh, you know as, as somebody said the the word of the day is trade-offs um I, I i like peter's idea of getting through the iso proposal to see what's workable what's not workable or where there's misconceptions potentially and it may be a case of you know is it a, a, a you know a zonal versus nodal discussion I, I i don't think in my mind that does it because there's some Great questions raised about do we really need imbalance reserve down at the moment? I mean, you, you made statements yesterday that I completely concur with. If it's not needed, price. Um, but our, and WPTF have put up their framework. One thing that's that's missing, I know there's a 
you know, there's a focus on price formation. There's nothing around reliability. Is the intent at the end of your presentation or maybe later that we're going to discuss maybe a framework or putting together a framework as a, a, as a group to, to land this thing within the timeline that we've given ourselves? Um, I think, it, you know, June or May or June or whatever it is. Is that the intent by the, before we leave today? That's a great question, and the answer, unfortunately, is no. However, um, let me just lay out a little bit what the plan sort of looks like going forward. So um, we still have the uh, Market Surveillance Committee discussion on Friday, and we thought it might, may have been premature to sort of uh, agree on steps forward before having that discussion, and uh, no MSC members want to present on th these ideas, and um, you know they're going to want to arbitrate uh, some of the, the, the points that have been raised. Um, so we, we sort of felt like this process in terms of the recollection, I wouldn't say ended there, but um, that's going to be sort of a cutoff point with which after that time, um, we would pause for some period of time to collect stakeholder comments. So stakeholders can reflect on what they heard at the workshops, what they heard at the MSC meeting, provide comment to the CAISO so that we can then recalibrate uh, re um, where we wanna move forward as we approach the, the May board. So um, just, just one more thing to be clear on timing. So, you know, the, the target for Dame board um, decision is in May. I believe the board meeting is May 17th. So in terms of if we were to meet that target, you're looking at uh, sort of a drop dead deadline of policy decisions probably in mid, mid April to allow for sufficient time for preparation to the board. So I do want to, you know, point out that even with, if you had a two week comment period after the MSC meeting, that still leaves, you know, maybe three weeks or so to come back. If, if work, more workshops need to be held or other touch points need to be had, there's still some time in between there to agree on, you know, how we, how we proceed. So um, I hope that helps. Cool. Yeah, that does help. And, uh, and I better appreciate the thinking. So thank you. I think uh, potentially in the interest of time, I may skip a few slides and if I have time, I'll come back because I do want to talk about um, the congestion uh, revenue is, uh, ideas that we've had. So let's skip until you see the slide that says congestion revenue problems on the... Oh, I didn't have far to go. Okay, so um, we, we had been uh, hinting that, you know, in this time we had been doing some thinking about, you know, issues that had been raised and, and actually had been acknowledged by the CAISO in the proposal that the way that imbalance reserve flows on the system, way that they're modeled, there's potential for an under collection of congestion revenue relative to today's, uh, to the status quo and a potential need to um, address that issue. And so, uh, the benefit of some more time to think about this gave us some more time as a team to go back and, and sort of relook at the problem and think about solutions. And we sort of want to, um, this is not a uh, proposal read, like a written proposal ready idea, but it's just something that we can share and people can start thinking about as we prepare to, you know, eventually a, a revised written proposal for Dame. So let's, let's sort of review what the issue is first that, um, you know, the, the current proposal, and as outlined in the final proposal, allocates imbalance reserve costs based on payments to suppliers at their location. So essentially what that means is that if you're, if you're thinking about that relative to how energy is settled, where you have um, the settlement of load at load locations at their nodes and the um, um, settlement of suppliers at their location, you have in between there, you have some sort of congestion revenue based on the price differences of that settlement. So by the, the method of the cost allocation and settling the imbalance reserve costs to um, payments to suppliers at their location, essentially what you're missing is the, any congestion revenue portion of, of any price differences resulting from that. Um, and thus the ISO would not collect congestion revenue on the imbalance reserve flow to the extent you'd had binding constraints in the deployment scenarios. Um, so the second bullet explains that today CR payments are 
you know, due to binding constraints are adjusted so that they do not exceed the congestion revenue collected due, the, due to that constraint. So the, the issue is that if you do not collect the congestion revenue, you can't pay the, the congestion or the CR or whatever um, congestion component at that location because the, the, pay, the settlement of the CR is capped at the amount that was actually collected. So from that sense, there may be shortfalls in paying for CRs. And uh, if I use the word CR, I, I want to actually say congestion revenue more broadly. Um, so there may be shortfall in um, paying for congestion or collecting congestion revenues on constraints that buy, bind in the deployment scenarios. So don't go to the next slide yet, but I'm just uh, a warning. You're gonna see a diagram with, with numbers and figures and arrows, and I'm gonna guide you through what's the most important part of this figure to look at so you don't get confused. So, okay, be prepared. Next slide. Okay, so this figure um, comes out of uh, Appendix C of one of the um, ISO's um, proposals for day ahead market enhancements, and it's intended to uh, in, um, provoke a discussion about local market power, but it actually also nicely illustrates a potential issue about revenue, uh, congestion revenue collection. Okay, so there's a lot of pretty numbers, but I want to focus on that red arrow in the middle of the screen. Um, that depicts a flow vertically between some point A at the top and some point B at the top. And essentially what we're trying to depict here is that there's some sort of 50 megawatt flow on this, on this path. And you could imagine that, if you would imagine that this, um, you know, this path had a 50 megawatt constraint, essentially what's happening in this scenario based on the prices that are offered uh, by the generators here is that you have some portion um, of the flow binding in the deployment scenario. So the 40 megawatts in blue here is intended to reflect the quantity of, of transmission that's reflected in the base scenario and the additional 10 uh, being the, the, the incremental quantity flowing in the deployment scenario. And having that 10 megawatt flow there um, binds the constraint. And so the important thing to, to realize here is that um, in a counterfactual world where there's no imbalance reserve, you would still have a 50 megawatt flow going down this path and it would bind the constraint. But the issue here now is that by the way that we collect congestion revenue, this, this 10 megawatts of, of flow that's binding in the deployment scenario, you could think of as sort of displacing um, 10 megawatts that would have been in the energy flows within the absence of imbalance reserve. And you're not collecting congestion revenues in uh, for the 10 megawatt portion. So essentially you go from having a path and if you had a CR you know, on this path from, from a supply to load, you would have in the status quo, a 50 megawatt flow times a $45, mega, $45 shadow price, wherein in the imbalance reserve deployment scenario, you now only have a 40 megawatt flow times a $45 shadow price. So essentially there's $450 of congestion revenue that we would have collected in the status quo, but we don't in the, with the deployment scenarios. Um, so I hope this at least gives a, um, a high level look of with an example, you can come back to the example and look at it later if it helps. But just to show that the, the, the summary is that there can be flows in the deployment scenario when they bind that displace um, you know, binding flow or flows from the, um, base scenario, and therefore less congestion, re congestion revenue is collected. So very simple slide. We just want to provide what is the objective of what we're trying to solve? And we, we agree with stakeholders. This is, and, and in the final proposal, we agreed that this is a problem we would monitor. But there were, um, you know, there were comments to say, look, I think this is a, a bigger issue than you're making out of it. You know, so let's think about it some more. So what we have to do. First, we have to devise a method to actually co collect the congestion rent. That's important because without the congestion rent, you can't pay the CRs, you can't pay congestion revenues for um, EDAM entities. Um, how you would collect that congestion rent, we have some thoughts around that. But the second component actually involves, at least for the CAISO, um, consideration of actually expanding the financial right associated with the CRR, whereas today the financial right um, allows for um, you know payments on on flows for energy energy on binding constraints, where we could think of it as expanding that financial right to include 
flows of energy and deployed imbalanced reserve. Um, so you'd have to get both of those things at least um, in, for, uh, to get the, um, the problem fixed. So, you know, the team brainstormed a number of different ways how you could identify the congestion revenue shortfalls with which to collect. And um, we, would, we would identify that by looking at, um, you know, the deployment scenarios and curing shortfalls um, based on identifying when there are binding constraints in the deployment scenarios. We can use that portion of the constraint and multiply it by um, you know, the shift factor cost and um, identify some sort of uh, missing congestion revenue. So what would happen is that you would collect this congestion revenue through um, in including it within the imbalance reserve cost allocation. So essentially the imbalance reserve cost allocation would, uh, you know, in, um, allocate costs to the various parties, um, both by collecting or um, the pot of money would be formed both from the payments that you're giving to suppliers. So that's already the cost that's allocated in the proposal, but now also including the congestion revenue that's collected through this process. So you would have um, congestion revenue and the imbalance reserve cost to suppliers allocated out through the existing congestion or, or the existing imbalance reserve um, cost allocation. And then that congestion revenue can either be used to fund CRRs if in the CAISO process, or they can be used in the case for EDAM BAs to fund congestion offsets for, um, for EDAM BAs as well. So it should be able to be applicable both for CAISO in their CR process and the differing ways that potential EDAM entities allocate congestion revenues in their BA through their OATS. Um, so I, I thought I'd pause here and, and see if there's any reaction if George or James want to add any context to, you know, how we might implement this more specifically, um, that might be welcome, but I'll pause there. We do have some hands raised over the phones. So let's go to Alan Meck. Alan, go ahead, your line is unmuted. There we go. How about now? Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Um, Alan Mack, SDG. So the first thing I'm trying to understand is um, what I heard you say originally, James, is that there wouldn't be a concern with these congestion pricing because you're not collecting additional congestion rents as a result of imbalanced reserve awards. And thus, there's no extra revenue to distribute to CRRs. But then, your bullet two here, you're saying that there would be congestion shortfalls as a result of IRU, and that we would have to collect those. Um, I'm not understanding those two points. So let's go back to the last slide, the diagram. So again, try not to be um, too overwhelmed with the the numbers here, but the, the idea of this figure is to show that relative to the status quo, if you had situations where congestion uh, or transmission constraints bound in the deployment scenarios, then you would have less congestion revenue collected relative to the status quo to fund PRs or other uh, congestion offsets. So basically what we're saying is that without the thing that we're proposing, um, you don't have this $450 um, Collect, um, collection, which 450 comes from the 10 megawatt flow in purple. That's intended to represent the flow in the deployment scenario um, or the incremental flow. And the $45 cost in purple, which is intended to represent the shadow cost of, of the constraint at that, trans, uh, at that transmission constraint. So without the proposal, you missed that $450 and any, any uh, CRRs or any um, even e however EDMBAs allocate their congestion is missing this pot of money with which to distribute however they use it. So basically what we're saying is we are going to identify this 450 megawatts, or sorry, this $450, and we're going to collect the $450 through the imbalance reserve cost allocation. And then once we have it, we will either use it to fund CRRs or we'll use it um, you know, to help 
eat MBAs fund their uh, congestion revenues. I see. Okay, thank you for that. That helps. That helps a lot. Um, I have a second question, though. So I, I understand your first point that you don't believe there would be um, a congestion pricing impact as a direct result of imbalance reserves. But I'm wondering if there's an indirect result because if IR, you and IRG are going to co-optimize with energy, what if IRU is taking up flow on a line that would otherwise have been um, preferably used by an energy schedule, which then causes you to have to commit a more expensive generator at the other end of the line? Um, but for those imbalanced reserves, do the so energy schedule still reflect some phantom congestion pricing there? Yeah, so to be let me back up a, se a second to say congestion pricing for imbalance reserves exists, but the way that we settle, um, the way that we settle the imbalance reserve product results in the lack of collection of congestion revenue. Um, so it's 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 really um, it's not so much the price; it's the settlement of of the congestion of the imbalance reserve that leads to the you know uncollection of this revenue. And then the second question is that, you know, that's part of the market optimization's job in this case is to identify the most optimal use of the transmission. And so in this case, based on the prices and the, and the um, you know, power flow modeled here, it's the most efficient, um, it's more efficient for the flows to be consumed within the deployment scenario based on the relative prices of the generators that are offering it. And so, um, you know, all we're saying is that if that if that were to happen, let's identify those cases where you have binding constraints um, in the deployment scenarios, identify sort of the um, congestion revenue that's associated with that um, and um, allocate that out through the cost allocation. I, I'm with you that the market is is optimizing and choosing the more preferable option between uh, an imbalanced reserve award versus an energy schedule. My my question though is that are you still getting phantom congestion even though it might not be showing up explicitly within um, your imbalanced reserve? Would it be showing up as a secondary, uh, like as a byproduct, because the energy schedules would then reflect additional congestion that might not have shown up? but for the fact that the imbalance reserve is now sitting there taking up an additional uh, amount of megawatts on a line. So the, the term phantom congestion is not our term. So I, I think it was used yesterday to describe situations where you would have um, binding constraints in the deployment scenarios. And the idea is that the term phantom congestion is used to describe the the phenomena that 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 um, flow may not occur unless the deployment scenario or the uncertainty is actually realized, and so um, I'm not I'm not sure how to answer the question about whether you still have phantom congestion because if you're if you're using the term phantom congestion to describe um, binding constraints in the deployment scenarios, the answer is yes, that's that still happens. Um, yeah, so I think that. I think that's what we mean. I'm, I'm sorry for using imprecise language. Um, but yeah, that's what I mean, is that there would be congestion showing up in the energy schedules that, but for the inclusion of the imbalance reserve product would not have been there necessarily. So or yeah, so, not to that degree. Yeah. so the point, yeah. So what you're getting at is the counterfactual here, in the absence of imbalance reserve, you run the same power flow You'd have the same constraint uh, binding, but you would have it all binding for energy. And because you have it all binding for energy, you have full collection of congestion revenue between those points. Uh, now, I'm not uh -huh. uh, sorry. I'm not really thinking about this this diagram that you have here. I, I'm thinking of a much more simple. Let's just take uh, from A to B. You have a generator on both sides of A and B, and um, well, let's say you have two generators at A and one generator at B, and let's say the generator at B is substantially more, more expensive. Let's say it's $100 a megawatt hour, and the generators at A are both $50 a megawatt hour, and there's 
the same 50 megawatt transfer capability across that line. And it, in a scenario with only energy, you would prefer to flow 50 megawatts worth of energy across that line. And let's say there'd be no congestion in that case, but because there is imbalanced reserve, let's say that uh, you include imbalanced reserve and there's 10 megawatts of imbalanced reserve that goes on that line. Now you can only flow 40 megawatts of energy across that line and you have to commit 10 megawatts at point B at double the cost. And that shows up as congestion in the energy price. So I think um, I'm not going to be able to completely answer the question because it's, it's complicated, but I think maybe what you're getting at is that this situation describes a, 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 um, an example where you the constraint would have bound in the energy scenario anyway, but you're describing a situation where, well, maybe if in absence of imbalance reserve, you would not have had a, a binding constraint in this scenario. And then by including the imbalances or flow, now all of a sudden you do have uh, a binding constraint. And so wow. is, it, is it essentially additive or adding on congestion revenue that in the, in the counterfactual or the status quo wouldn't have existed in the first place? Is that yeah. kind of what you're getting at? Yeah. Yeah. It's, an, it's a nuanced question and allow us to take some time to think about it, but, but thanks for bringing it up and we'll, we'll think some more about it. Thank you. Okay, let's go to Seth Cochran. Uh, Seth with DC Energy. Uh, James, thanks for putting this three bus model together. And I, I think it's the same one that you used back in the MSC meeting back in uh, April or May of 2022. Um, I just had a, a question to make sure I precisely understand. Um, so what you're saying is today you would uplift the $60 of uh, imbalance reserves uh, to deviations, but under this idea that you have, you would uh, uplift the full marginal value of five hundred and ten dollars. Is that precisely what you're saying? Yes, and then the um, sixty dollars that you collect would be used to pay suppliers, and um, the four hundred and fifty dollar portion of that pot would be used to fund congestion revenues or or CRs wherever they occur. Correct. That makes sense because then the congestion funding is made whole to support the CRs that were offered. Okay. Thank you. All right. Moving to Jeff Nelson. Jeff, go ahead. You are unmuted. Just be sure to select um, allow to unmute on your screen. Jeff, we'll come back to you. Um, Michelle, do we still have a question from the phone line? We do. your line is unmuted, you may go ahead. Great, thank you. This is Kathleen Colbert from Vistra. Can you hear me? Hey, Kathleen. Yeah. Hey, how's it going? Um, I've been listening intermittently. Seems like it's been a great morning. Um, I wanted to revisit, I actually, I raised my hand when Stuart and you were discussing, so if you don't mind, I actually want to pull the conversation kind of back to next steps um, unless since I'm the last questioner I, I assume that's okay but can you just confirm James this is a, I know Jeff still is trying to get his question answered but um, but yeah go, Did he go ahead. be unmuted okay. for me? Okay. yeah go ahead that, that's okay okay let's then let's um transition so Kind of going back to next steps, I really um, appreciated Stuart asking that question and kind of lobbying that. I also thought we'd have a fairly robust conversation about where 
uh, where we're going from here. So I have a couple of follow-up questions to um, the response you gave to Stuart. Um, I think one of my, so one of my, or, or, or I think that would be helpful for everyone to understand at least my understanding and then have you correct me or clarify and then I'm hoping that will help the broader group. But my understanding is that the commitments that have been made are that we need to make, bring forward, that the CAISO needs to bring forward a proposal um, to the May board. And it is, and so I know that date has been put down. Um, it'd be helpful for the CAISO to confirm if that is actually the, like a hard deadline, or if there's flexibility to bring it to the June board or the July board without hurting timelines. So I think that's one open question um, for you. And then I have, a, I think, one or two more. But can you start with that? The, the, the reason why May was chosen, it was strategically chosen in, in, in connection with timing of, about um, filing and, and implementation of EDAM. Um, and so any extension beyond May would have to consider, you know, what that looks like in terms of EDAM, uh, you know, filing and, and implementation. I don't know if other my other colleagues had anything to add on that. Hey James, uh, this is Becky Robinson with the ISO. I can I can offer a little bit more just to, yeah, Kathleen, thanks for the question, and I appreciate that that um, that there, you know, we do need to kind of map out what are the next steps between now and the May board meeting, but but I do think that you know we are we are committed to the May board meeting, and it's not June and it's not July. Um, you know, I think it's it's certainly a fair question. I understand you asking because there's been a lot of good conversation uh, during these workshops and a lot of ideas put on the table. Um, but I think you know the the um, at the last board discussion, you know, we scoped out. You know, this is where we've gotten to on the day ahead market enhancements, and 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 we think that this is a critical piece to go forward with EDAM. Um, but there are there were some you know lingering issues that we wanted to take some additional time to to give to get a, give the benefit of everyone, um, stakeholders, ISO staff, and others you know to kind of flesh those out more and to to hash out those issues and to make sure that we're going forward with a good design. But I think that um, it is it it has been I've heard pretty firmly <laughs> that uh, we are committed to. Um, you know, to taking that time and to, to, to this intellectually honest conversation and to, you know, I think, you know, internally we'll be um, digesting what all we've heard and, and, you know, you'll hear more from us on next steps. And I know we, we need to do that to give clarity to everyone on, on how you all can, can chime in and, and provide comments and so forth. Um, so stay tuned on that front. But, but I do just want to set expectations that we, you know, we're not we're not extending the period of time that we have you know stated that we're going to take that is that is the plan and um, and you'll hear more from us on next steps but I appreciate the question and appreciate everyone's um, you know involvement and engagement on these issues and and continued engagement as we get as we work from from now until you know continue working these questions um, to get to the May board meeting thanks Kathleen that's super helpful Becky um, in a, a little bit of the back and forth over the last couple of days I think that that firm deadline got a little murky. So I thought ending today with that clarity would be very helpful. Um, that was my understanding. So now it's great that we all share that understanding. Um, the other thing that I understand or understood is that we need, um, the Kaiser needs to produce a final proposal um, mid-April to maybe late April with a very quick turnaround for all those board docs um, but there is a little wiggle room, but let's say mid-April, third week of April, um, we are right now kind of in the beginning of March. That puts us, I'd say, four weeks or so for us to pivot if we need to pivot and move in a different design direction. Um, that is the reason and the context for why we put forward such a detailed proposal yesterday because what we had been communicating, so what I understood or took away from the conversations leading up to these workshops is that a conceptual discussion on trade-offs, pros and cons, all this stuff is really helpful 
for the CAISO and for stakeholders when you go back to look at that proposal in detail, but that we're really at a place where the rubber meets the road. So that if we, as a stakeholder community, want to have the CAISO review and really consider a, a zonal framework, as I think Carrie was referring to it, of some kind, then we need to have a proposal with design details flipped out incredibly fast, which is what we did and we followed through on that. Since we followed through on our commitment to provide that design proposal and policy proposals, um, our, I, let me be, I hope super transparent, my expectation is that as a next step, if the CAISO takes that, reviews it in detail, and then makes it their own. Like I understand the resource constraints of why there was a need to have others kind of bring that to the table um, because you were working on some other issues that was on your um, initial proposal, but it's incredibly important that it not be seen as a stakeholder proposal. We've done that for these two workshops just to get this over that, that hurdle um, and recognize that issue of there needed to be help. Um, moving forward, we need to see a KISO zonal framework in the level of detail that I put forward. So I'm really hopeful that you will take that and that will expedite your timelines and that we can see a KISO proposal written out in the same level of detail, um, ideally Friday, if not Friday, then early next week. So that would be my ask and that is, that's my expectation, which would be a good faith way to move this process forward. Hey, Kathleen, this is Anna. I just wanted to make a couple of comments. Um, first of all, I, I appreciate all the work you've put into the proposal. And, um, you know, this conversation the past couple of days has been extraordinarily beneficial to all of us to really understand the, I think, the pros and cons and the um, trade-offs between the different approaches. Um, I think that what's critical at this point is that we take... Um, you know, an opportunity to really make a decision as to whether we will pivot or not. I'm hopeful that there wasn't an expectation created over the past couple of days when I stepped out that we were just going to pivot to a zonal design. I think there's still a lot of questions at play uh, before that happens. And so I don't want to create the expectation, as you've articulated, that we're just going to adopt your proposal and start moving with it. Because unfortunately, I think we still have to ask and answer the question for ourselves as to whether that's the right thing to do. And so I think the next steps for us that is, is the, yeah. I completely agree with you, Anna. I just wanted you to know that. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, I just want to set the expectations right. I, so so our hope yeah. is that- I think you're um, so our expectation, I think, at least myself, I think others, is not that you make a decision to pivot, but that what we understand that we need is, to, is, is for you to develop and own an alternative proposal for a zonal framework, addresses the issues that's been raised here. Okay. It's really important for stakeholders to see them side by side, right? That's the ask that has been made, I think, by more than one person. Um, right. And so completely understand that you need more time, but I think from a stakeholder community perspective, and I hope you can understand this, we also need to see the two things side by side um, so we can actually have a more certainty of what the stakeholders need to provide written comments on. I think that will just be so much more helpful for you when you get the comments on the two potential KISO views on what could happen, but of course not a commitment to pivot to it. Right. I hope that helps. So, so maybe it wasn't clear when we took the additional step this week to provide a conceptual framework around a zonal approach that we think might be feasible that meets some of the requirements. And we've had a good conversation about, you know, that framework and how there are the pros and cons. And so I think we have taken that step. Um, it's, you know, uh, critical, and I'll reiterate what Becky reiterated, is that we will be moving towards a May uh, timeframe. And we think what we have, based on the discussions of the past few days, will provide us the opportunity to weigh those trade-offs a little bit more effectively. 
and be able to make that decision and ask stakeholders to do that. And so um, I think with that in mind, uh, we hope that folks have had, you know, um, a lot of time over the past uh, few workshops to ask the questions needed. And we hope we've provided some good answers. Um, I think George, uh, I think did a great job <laughs> at, you know, fleshing out and, and, and putting a perspective that we think uh, can be feasible. Uh, but there's some real questions there in that framework that still uh, we need to get some feedback on. So with that in mind, our next step will be to seek some of that feedback from folks based on discussions from you know what we've heard so we can make that pivotal decision as to whether we shift or not um, in the next phase. And I think uh, before I move to- Karen, I hear you, I believe I saw Kirsten I, stand. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna say thank you. Um, thanks for the opportunity. I think that any decision of how you move forward with these next steps will really inform how stakeholder engagement continues and any future efforts. So I just keep that in mind. Thank you. This is uh, Christine Rock with Pacific Corps. I wanted to just very quickly say. Thank you for the communication, for the, the information everybody presented, the amount of work that went into this was obviously uh, a lot. We've heard a lot, a lot of interesting concepts were discussed and elucidated. <coughs> I do think the concept that WPTF came up with, this kind of continuous concept of going from, from you know, high level to the, to the nodal, which and that there is a lot of different design choices specifically on the zonal on how to define that. I think that's very important. It's also very complicating. It makes me a little nervous to hear that some people will have 10 other design choices to present on Friday. Um, will perhaps similarly not shock anybody that Pacific Core is very actively focused on looking at feasibility and what some of these things will look in the real like and in, in the real world. So we are firmly supportive of the May board timeline and iterating to conclusion. I want to thank everybody. And I think this process of stakeholder feedback and engagement has been incredible. I do really like the concept of the, the matrix and using that matrix kind of at the high level, the WPTF put together and perhaps suggest the Kai. So at least look at that to see if that might be a good framework to, um, you know, solicit feedback in kind of a structured fashion as well from stakeholders. Um, I know that in my organization, I'm going to ask us to kind of flesh that out and even put our position and our operational concerns there. So really helpful framework, but I really, um, you know, want to encourage folks to, the, the EDAM has been improved to move forward. We have an implementation timeline. We're ramping up to do that there's tariff development work streams that are happening. So I think the concept of kind of kicking the can down the road is complicated and um, we, we're really supportive of the May timeline and want to thank anybody, everybody here for the work today. Thank you. No, not on, on. Okay, uh, Carrie Bentley with the Western Power Trading Forum. Um, two quick questions, and maybe the first one's actually for you. I, I'm a little unclear what is driving the, the May deadline and whether it, it's your implementation schedule or whether it's tariff filings, um, because I, I struggle with, given the conversation today, I think it's pretty apparent that there are issues that need to, even if we stick with the nodal, there are enhancements and more transparency that needs to be made with the nodal design and trying to get that done concurrently with the zonal framework, that seems incredibly challenging. And to me, I mean, EDAM aside, you know, this is a billion dollar market. Let's not just do this on the fly. Um, so I'm a little, I, I guess, confused why that May deadline is so hard given the importance of this initiative. That's just question one. Was that to Kirsten or to me? I'll take it. <laughs> um, so I think the May deadline is critical because, you know, as we move forward with our filings, this is an important part of the EDAM design as well. And we noted that we would want to have the imbalance reserve product in there and having certainty as to how that will unfold obviously dictates also whether or not we may have to make some changes to the EDAM design. So it's critical that those things move in line. If you work backwards in terms of time and implementation, we're very enthusiastic and really happy that we actually got such great movement with EDAM. And so we're moving towards that timeline, um, you know, in earnest. 
And if we spend another year or two discussing a lot of the issues that we've been discussing, that's not going to, you know, move with that. So what I would suggest is that, and I, to your point, Carrie, where, you know, there may be some additional design elements that need to be further fleshed. I think we'll diligently have to work some of those and make those lists. If there's something that needs to be tabled for later, that's probably not critical to the overall design, we'll make those decisions. I think you guys have seen us do things like that in the past. We'll do that again. We'll make sure that things don't get left unaddressed. But if there's things that are, you know, as pivotal as are we pursuing a more zonal approach or a hybrid approach or a nodal approach, I think that decision needs to be made sooner rather than later so that we can move forward. Um, so May is pivotal for purposes of getting the design locked down and, you know, moving towards filings so that when we go to FERC, they know what's going on as well. Um, so, and maybe you do have a response too, but I'll just say, you know, there, you say we can't keep going a year or two, like there's a lot of space between May and like a year or two. So I'm just wondering if there, is there an extra month or two? It's hard take. for me to say, unless I really understand what those issues are open, but we will be looking at that very critically and make sure that we don't compromise design and, and input that we get from folks. And, but I do want to be clear about the expectation that Look, there's a, we, we, we have done this in earnest. You know, we went back, we literally said, I've done a lot of thinking around, okay, what, what are the issues that are being presented? And I really appreciate the deep dives you guys have taken. But at the end of the day, we don't want this to be, you know, something that becomes the Achilles heel here that, you know, prevents us from moving forward. And so I'll be honest, I think we've, this conversation's educated me a lot. And it's educated all of us a lot, and it's been really helpful. But I think we're going to have to put our hats together and our efforts together to make this thing go forward. And um, that should be our, our intent. And some of the um, remaining questions, perhaps, on like if we go nodal, then you know what needs to be uh, addressed. Hopefully, those won't be so pivotal that it will require too extensive a time. But to your point, if I have to call a special meeting in early June to get it done, I will do that. We will do that. You know, we'll do the best we can. But May is pretty much a time that we're targeting. And I don't want to interfere with your summer plans either. I do have a, a June vacation. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think, you know, that's really helpful to know that maybe, you know, special board meetings are possible. You know, um, just to be very transparent, not only do we see FERC risk in a lot of these elements, um, we also have some lines in the sand, which I know you hate that phrase, but we do have some things where if they go forward, WPTF will protest. I think you've addressed some of them, but not all of them. Um, and those are ones that either need to change about the nodal design or we have to pivot to zonal. And so it's very much, I hate FERC protests more than anything in my job. It is the worst thing. It means we failed, right? Um, and so I really just want us to take the time we need, not a year, not even six months, but the time we need to make sure stakeholders are together in this and we don't risk this um, for our protest or someone else's. Hello. Great. I know Jeff here. So um, okay. I'm sure we can get there. I, I think it's a good point. I think, you know, if there's regulatory risk associated with that, we should not just rush, but I think the dialogue this week has been very, and last week was very beneficial in moving a lot of those pieces along. And maybe let's see what we have left as to what is really critical. And I'm happy to hear that there's a road either way, either a more, I'm gonna call it zo zodal or maybe nozzle approach. Uh, you like nozzle? I like nozzle too. But we really need to think about, you know, what is it exactly? that's left on, you know, as concerns and, and decide on that. And, and I don't think we're prepared today to say, you know, we're going to shift to zonal because we think that's the way to go. I think we've heard a lot. We're going to take that into consideration. But I, I think it's really critical that, um, and I'm happy to hear that stakeholders, you know, some stakeholders and yourself, that we want to move forward to make this productive this year so that we can get that EDEM design before FERC and we could get EDEM going as soon as possible. This is um, Kirstine one more time with PAC, and and I want to just clarify that we're not just kind of promoting the the blind forward movement of these things without consideration of outstanding issues. I think uh, both Vista and WPTF have done a good job outlining kind of what issues, even within the current design, may need to be addressed, and made very good points about that. Um, you know, and, and we'll defer to the Kaisos team to kind of see what the art of possible looks like in terms of. Uh, 
before you vacation carry on in June. But um, I do think, you know, considering, uh, considering, and as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the EDAM entities, you know, some of these proposals were, were contextualizing through what's possible for the CAISO operators. I think there's this very big space for us and we, throughout all of this have been discussing with our grid operators, you know, what would this look like if we had to set up these zones? What would this look like if we had to maintain them? Which kind of zones, what constraints do we have? I think some of these conversations for a lot of EDEM entities perhaps might be new at a kind of a, a policy level in this regard. So we also need some time to have these internal conversations to come more prepared. So we, we are certainly doing that. I would encourage similar entities that are looking perhaps at, at these markets to, to start that internal kind of fleshing out of the information. But, um, you know, for all the good reasons that Anna just outlined, I think timeline is, is healthy urgency is uh, while considering the stakeholder process is, is something we're really keen on uh, without breaking anything, without obviously endangering the market design. So um, thanks um, everybody. Hi, uh, this is Jeff, can, am I on? Can I be heard? Yes. yes. Hey, great, I apologize for the technical difficulties. Uh, just, I, I just, I understand this a uh, nozzle conversation. I, I really don't want the Edison proposal to just be ignored. Uh, I think this this proposal right here that you're showing here is getting to some of the core issues that we have. And the issue is your pretending capacity is flowing energy, and that that has here in this case, it has it has the implications of creating a tenfold uplift for the IRP product that was just described. And that means in effect, your, this proposal is, is mispricing IRP if there's, that, if there's gonna be uplift associated with it. It results in mispricing congestion as we're seeing here because you're pretending it's flowing energy when it's not. And that sort of undermines the whole sort of foundation of how we're collecting and billing congestion. It's going to get in the way of the CRR allocations for simultaneous feasibility. It creates, in our opinion, the virtual issues that were discussed both by our presentation and by uh, uh, the, the earlier presentation today, I forget who was carrying or, or who was presenting it. So uh, I really think it's a path forward. And I think it's a fast path forward. The last thing we wanna do is delay the process, uh, but th this shows it. I mean, you're really, in effect, what you're doing here is, is, you're, is you're in effect derating the entire transmission system to accommodate this design. And that's going to have a sort of a deadweight loss. Uh, and that deadweight loss has to be considered with the sort of the, the purported benefits of doing a simultaneous optimization, which we've talked about is uh, very unlikely to ever materialize. So I really, really want to put the Edison proposal as a path forward. Uh, and I'll stop there. Really appreciate the conversation. We don't want to delay. We do want to move expeditiously. Thanks, Jeff. I know we're past noon, but we have, I think, two more questions in the queue. So we'll take those and then we'll wrap up. So let's go to Sergio. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, yes, this is Sergio Luenas with the California Energy Storage Alliance. So I raised my hand uh, a while back when um, Kathleen was uh, asking generally about the uh, next steps on the process. So my question is, um, there have been some specific storage questions uh, that CISA and other stakeholders have communicated to ISO staff. Uh, I think that in those conversations, there's been you know, the potential to have a, a meeting on storage specific questions. So given that the ISO is um, uh, very committed to this May timeline, and as it would seem from the response to Kathleen, they're also committed to uh, a revised uh, final proposal by sometime in April. Um, I was wondering if uh, we could uh, talk about, you know, the potential to have another workshop late March uh, something like this, you know, half a day 
uh, to be able to talk about the issues and the proposal that some stakeholders have been putting together um, something late March or early April. Um, yeah, was wondering if there were some thoughts on that. And this is specifically regarding how to reflect the impact of imbalance reserves in the state of charge calculation and the ancillary service uh, state of charge constraint. Yeah. Thanks, Sergio. This is James. So it, it, it seems to me that, you know, what we don't want to do is on April 17th, put out a final proposal and call it good and head to the board. So whether it be storage or CRs or, um, you know, any sort of design changes that would be made and put forth, um, we would need to build in the time to discuss those with stakeholders in advance of a written proposal in this case. So um, I think that, you know, we've, we've had some storage um, discussions offline and hopefully are advancing towards something that we can, uh, you know, share more broadly. And that would be done in advance of, you know, uh, a final, I guess we'll call it a revised final proposal. But, um, you know, we would make the space to do that. Good to hear. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Petter. Go ahead, your line is unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, you can hear you. Go ahead, Peta. Okay, I, I would like to follow up quickly on what Jeff just said. <clears throat> uh, their proposal is something that actually can simplify quite a, bit, quite a few things. I'll just give you one example. It may solve the CRR problems, and in that sense, we will speed up implementation. And it's very important to speed up implementation because DAME is foundation for IDAM. IDAM cannot move forward without DAME implement. It's like building a second floor of the house when the first floor is not designed yet. From that point of view, there is an urgency to, to kind of uh, move forward instead of now coming up with alternative proposal. Saying that, it is uh, very useful to look into zonal proposal, which by now, thanks to WPTF, there is a lot of information and see if, uh, what from there can be used to improve nodal. And at the same time, it would be good for Kaiso to come up with cons against the proposal to move IR to RAC. Because I regularly remember that we considered that in the past and I don't remember reasons why we gave up on that. It must be some cons there that may outweigh the pros of that approach. So it would be good from anybody at Kaiso who still remembers that to come up with those things and put that on the, on the paper so that can be evaluated quickly. Thank you very much. All right, I think we have one final question over the phone, Michelle. Holy, your line is unmuted, you may go ahead. I think they may have changed their mind. I think they were with their hands. Is, is this Kat, can you? Kathleen? Looks like your phone is cutting out. Okay. Well, Kathleen, if you want to follow up with us. Uh, okay. Yes. Sorry, um, can you hear me now? It's Kathleen Colbert. Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Oh, okay, perfect. Um, I just wanted to follow up and, and acknowledge. So I wanted to acknowledge, Jeff, you raised that you brought proposals. I'm sorry that I didn't refer to those when I was asking for the follow-up. I think that the follow-up, you know, our expectation is that we see that side-by-side -side of, of the Kaisers proposal they want to include this new hybrid, although frankly, it's not developed as well as the nodal proposal and the one that we developed. But to be fair to the CAISO, we were asked to bring that to the table um, like a month ago. So I think that was just a bandwidth and an advance notice for George. Um, if George had been always going to put forward a proposal, we wouldn't have brought one to the table. We were asked to bring it 
and to be a part of the collaboration. But Jeff Nelson also brought one. I think it's really fair um, to put that side by side. I want to illustrate why it's so important to develop out some of these details much like on the same level of granularity as the paper, which is what we did with our spy deck because that's what we knew needed to happen because it is incredibly hard for me as a stakeholder to process what might be three proposals, might be four proposals, and know what's really on the table. Some things are unmovable mountains, and we really should be clear, and the CAISO needs to be clear about what are the elements that are not movable. And that will help us simplify um, what we should even be spending a lot of time on our side considering and providing feedback on. Like, I, I appreciated Jeff's proposal to think about moving IR into RUC. My first reaction was, I would assume that's an unmovable mountain for the CAISO because you've spent so much time, and, and we tried to work almost. So we put forward a proposal that I think keeps 80% of what CAISO intends to do with some really key enhancements to specific issues um, because we thought a big change was, un, was just something that wouldn't happen. We need clarity from the CAISO on if the idea that Jeff put forward is something that we should be considering seriously or not. And we need that really soon. So I just wanted to, Jeff brought that up. It was a huge point. I did not mean to not mention his proposal. Um, and it also really highlights why we need to see what the options are that are actually on the table so that we can move forward collaboratively. Good afternoon, Christopher McLean, staff, California Energy Commission. W one um, thing that I think is important that uh, Mr. Nelson raised uh, um, it is sort of this issue about how, how do we conceptualize imbalance reserve flow? Uh, so if CAISO has any advice for how people ought to think about capacity flows, um, I'm all ears. That sounds like a George question. But essentially, I mean, I, I, I can tee it up. Essentially, the way it's described is that the, the, the flows of imbalance reserve are simulated energy flows, essentially, in order to model the deliverability of the product if they were to be converted into energy and, and used to resolve uncertainty. So do you have more to add to that? Well, it's the product of the shift factor for that location with the flexible ramp award. Shift factor, shift factor. <laughs> but it, it does bring in some interesting points because, you know, in yesterday's presentation, we're talking about what does nodal ancillary service mean? And is there, is there a paradigm shift in terms of thinking about capacity products and deliverability of, of those products? And um, potentially there is, and, and that, you know, maybe that conversation hap happens more deeply over time, but um thanks that uh that helps and then um i don't know there's probably some discussions maybe to be had about thinking differently on how these optimization problems are structured um we, we get into a space about uh counterfactuals i think it, it may behoove us to start designing sort of surrogate models that are sort of pre-solved modules that might plug and play in different hourly, weekly, sort of seasonal factors. We can talk about that more later, but um, I don't imagine it'll fit into this process at this time. Can I, um, can I say a quick word? I just wanna personally thank Carrie and Callie, Kathleen and Jeff We've all been iterating a lot over the last several weeks and um, appreciate your partnership. Um, so thank you very much. Yeah, just to conclude, I just wanna thank, repeat what James said, thank our presenters over the past few weeks and thank you all for making the trip out to Folsom for a vert or in-person meeting as well as our virtual participants on the phone. Um, just to wrap up, we will be taking comments on these past three two weeks of workshops. Um, I think our deadline right now that we've communicated is March 24th, um, but if that changes, we will update you. 
And we will be making a comment template with some questions available probably by the end of this week. Um, so thank you again for your participation and safe travels home and have a great rest of your week.